All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our fiscal year end review. Um, I'm Amanda. I'm getting us started today with the USAS checklist and presentation. Um, but a couple of things before we just dive right into that is um, I have the agenda pulled up here. So this is kind of what we're looking like today. Oop, I know I was going to get that pop up. Um, so we'll have USAS first. We're anticipating that to be about 45 minutes. We'll see how it goes. Um, and then um, we're going to have inventory next. That'll start around 945. And, uh, you know, we'll uh, try and take a little break there uh, between those two and then finish it up with USPS. So this is the plan. All right. Okay. So um, as normal, I'm going to start on our main page just to show you how to get to the materials, um, just to make sure that we have that um, sorted. So I'm on the main page of the wiki and I'm scrolling all the way down here to this SSDT meetings and trainings page. And um, you're probably familiar with this since you go through here to get to that training and registration. But on this first page, before you hop into that, we have a section for year end meeting materials. And so that is right here. Um, we have fiscal year end. And then within this page, we have all of the information or links to all of the information compiled in one place. So that agenda I just showed, um, we post that up here. And then um, for USAS, we have the um, presentation, which is what we're gonna go through today. And we'll talk through this together. The closing procedures or like the checklist, uh, this, here, let me open this in a new tab real quick. This is like your generic checklist that you can take and adopt to your ITC, um, you know, update anything that's more specific um, that you may do. But um, this is kind of the basics of what we're going to talk through in the presentation, just put into, you know, a numbered list for you. So pre-closing procedures, month end, fiscal year end closing, and then um, some post-closing procedures at the end here. So that is linked right there. And then if we come back here, we have a couple other supporting documents that we link. So this first one, setting estimates versus actual variances to zero. Um, this is equivalent to the classic set belt. Not every district uses this. They don't have to use this, but some of them like to. That's part of their process. So uh, this is a wiki. This links right to a wiki page that explains all of how that works. Um, it's actually a mass change definition, and it's got a bunch of detail there. So if that's something you're needing, there's the there's the link. Um, budgeting scenario steps. We have a link to this too. We actually talk through these steps in our February training. So if you missed that. Uh, definitely go check out the recording that is linked to the training page or it's out on our YouTube. Um, but if you have, you know, if your treasurers are looking for the specific steps, that's the direct link to the walkthrough. And then this last one here, um, financial extraction for an ITC, I believe this only applies to some ITCs. So, um, and, and this did not change from last year. So if, if this is something that you used last year, here's the link to it. Um, if you didn't use it last year, then I think you're good. So, <laughs> um, but that is just a quick link for uh, that process. That's in regards to like EMIS reporting. Um, and what we what we do is, so we have this page that we are um, sort of updating, like as we get ready for our meeting, you know, we have this all set to go like today going forward. Um, but if there is anything that gets changed, like say, you know, we come across something for year end, and, um, you know, even something we talk about today that we want to make a, an update to, we have these dates in the first column. So we're going to keep this updated. So like, you can see these things were updated, you know, previous to the meeting. But if that changes, and then you come out here, you know, and get a, a new version, like you can see basically at a glance if it's changed, I guess is the idea. So, um, so that's what's going on here. Uh, today, I'm going right into this ITC USAS fiscal year end review. So let me hop over here because I already have it pulled up. And let's get my notes sorted here to make sure we don't miss anything. 
Okay. All right, so let's hop into the presentation. Um, of course, I'm going to be going into the software as well. So we'll kind of switch back and forth between uh, both of these. Um, our first page here just shows the link to that page that we just talked about. So um, that is uh, in the presentation for you as a reference back. And the first thing we're gonna talk about are some things to consider prior to fiscal year end. So um, these are some procedures that they can do. Uh, it definitely depends on their own like policies and procedures as far as like how they may handle these or if they might do them. But um, just some things to mention uh, that if they do want to do these, it may be beneficial to do before year end. So the first is closing out all possible purchase orders. And we have this link to the FAQ because um, the FAQ includes some ways of like how to close purchase orders. Uh, but really what I wanna touch on here with why this may be important is any purchase orders that are open that have a remaining encumbrance at the end of the fiscal year, that remaining encumbrance is going to move when they close June and open July, that remaining encumbrance will become the carryover encumbrance in the new year. So it'll be the prior year encumbrance. Now that does get included in the expendable figure that gets um, calculated by carryover encumbrance plus what they budget. So um, basically this is going to be accounted for on, um, this is gonna be, I should say this a little bit differently because I'm gonna say accounts here. <laughs> so this will be included in some of their account figures. And so, um, Essentially, like it's okay that they carry these over, and um, in many cases, they want to and they should carry over remaining encumbrances. But if they have any purchase orders that are out there that they don't really need, um, maybe they just have them hanging open out there, there is a reason that it would be beneficial to close those at this point in time before they flip over their, their fiscal year. So if I go ahead and oops, there we go, I'm trying to open this, and I inserted something there. So um, I have a couple here, you know, how should a purchase order be paid on closed? Um, and there's essentially two different ways that they can do this. So they could um, go in and if the last invoice that happened was in a period that's open, they can go change that invoice from partial to full. Um, or they could create a cancel invoice um, to cancel the remaining amount and close that PO. Um, so yes, so those are the basics for that. And then, okay, review old outstanding disbursements. So this one, um, basically this can be helpful because, um, we do have an outstanding disbursement report that can help them when they're reconciling or, you know, trying to balance, like they can use that report. Um, what we've seen is like there is a potential where they might have old disbursements maybe that came over from classic maybe like old memo checks and um, those might still be outstanding so um, if they have that and they want to review and clean those up you know this would be a good time um, and then so i'm on the faq for disbursements and i believe it's the last one down here here we go how do i reconcile some imported memo checks and this gives an example of how you can filter and how you could um, easily reconcile those um, old ones so that they wouldn't show up on reports anymore. Or at least not reports for outstanding checks. <laughs> All right, um, add or customize a monthly report bundle. So, you know, this one, it, this is totally up to um, what you and your districts want to do. Uh, you know, I mean, you might have districts, I know some of you definitely do have districts that have a lot of custom monthly bundles out there already. But, um, you know, if you have districts that are wanting to set something like this up, uh, this could be a good time to review that and get that all set so that going forward for the new fiscal year, they would have those monthly bundles ready to start. And then the last thing on here is the maintenance of effort. And um, I'm going to flip to this next slide here because we actually have some more information on this. 
Um, so as far as the maintenance of effort, uh, basically this is uh, just something that is like tracked, it's important to their funding. So um, ODE annually reviews this. Um, so it's the district's local or state and local expenditures to make sure the budgets and expenditures are at least the same amounts of the funds of the previous year. So uh, we do have a report for this. Uh, there is a version of this budget summary, um, MOE. And let's go to, it's gonna be one of the template reports. And let's just do this. Let's do filter and see we have SSDT MOE. So they could run this budget summary. Now, the main difference with using this budget summary is that um, it has a filter on it. So you can use this version um, or and I believe we, I should, I, um, let me go in here. Let's look at the budget summary um, canned. Let me go back to default. There we go. So there's also an account filter that's built in to USAS that you can use to pull the maintenance of effort information. So um, it's the specific accounts. So um, if I click here, I can use this with the canned budget summary. Um, you know, usually I believe it's a budget summary that they're looking over, but if they did want to run another report, like a budget account activity, and have that narrowed down to the same parameters because they're trying to track a certain expenditure, they can also use this filter anywhere that you can use filters normally. So, um, so that's available in there. Let's close some of these extra tabs here. Oh, and so um, essentially with having this report available, um, this is something that eventually, um, when they do their EMIS submission, uh, it is looked at, but this gives them an opportunity to review that prior to reporting um, to try and um, like catch anything uh, if they need to make updates or, or move, move anything around. Okay. So, now we're going to talk about things that they can start doing um, prior to the new fiscal year. And I feel like what in what we discuss here, um, certainly there's like the month end closing process that happens and the fiscal process that, that happens, and we'll discuss that. But I feel like a lot of the USAS close is really kind of like, um, you know, reviewing some of these things ahead of time, getting ready for the next year um we have verifying data so looking at like the district and the building information accounts and opus um all three of these first things are related to the financial reporting um for emis to ode the preparing budgets and revenue estimates uh that's generally something they're pretty hitting pretty hard this time of year because they want to get those in um, and available as next year budgets so that um, the their district can start entering requisitions for the next fiscal year uh, before they're out for the summer. So um, as far as those first couple points, so the district of building information, again, this is used for their financial reporting. And the first place we're going to look is in this core organization page. And a lot of these things that we're about to look at are things that are going to be in here if they've, you know, if they, well, at this point, like, um, I guess there could be um, districts from like the the late waves maybe that this will be their first um, fiscal year, but um, essentially when they come over to redesign, this is stuff that we recommend to review. So um, what I mean here is that this information maybe this is like a, they're going to review this. They're not necessarily entering something that's blank, but if it is blank, they, they should enter. Um, okay, so organization detail. So they don't come in here too often. Basic district information here. Um, what we're looking at for this is this field right here, central office square footage. So this field is used um, for the reporting 
ITC IRN, um, I'm pointing this out because it used to be used, but it's not anymore. So like technically they don't really have to verify this one. Um, I mean, it's a field in here and it's a good reference. So, you know, they could enter that if they wanted to, but that's no longer being used for reporting. So mainly central office square footage, want to make sure that is um, filled in and accurate. If, if nothing's changed with their central office since the prior year, then uh, they don't have to change anything. But I feel like, you know, if they do make a change, like say they move offices, I'm sure their first thought wasn't to come into USAS and change this. So <laughs> it's good to review each year to make sure that, you know, something like this, if they're like, hey, wait, we did, we did move, they have a chance to come in and update that. All right, and then the next one, similar idea, uh, building profiles. If this is something that they've entered, that they've used in the past, um, these will remain in here year to year. So they're not necessarily entering these brand new, but they definitely want to review and make sure that all that's in here is accurate. So what we're going to see on this grid is we have um, a building for you know each building that they have in their district. So in this one, I have my high school, middle school, and two elementary schools. And um, you'd put the square footage again in there. And then we have the transportation percentage and the lunchroom percentage. And when these percents are entered, they do need to equal up to 100%. So um, because you could technically have as many like build it, like USAS will let you enter as many buildings as you need. But once they actually do the submission part to um, to EMIS, if it's not 100%, it'll get flagged. So uh, a really quick and easy way to verify that is to just use this report right from the grid. Generate the report. Mm -hmm. I feel like I clicked that too early. This is a quick one. There we go. And we can see our percentages, we get the 100%. So that's a that's a quick and easy check just uh, if they're entering multiple and they want to make sure because I mean, obviously, in my test instance, I have like 25%, 30%, you know, but that that might not be what this is realistically. Like they might have some more unique percentages that they need to make sure add up to 100. And then the building IRN as well, um, they'll enter. And so with creating ones, like it's pretty simple. Um, here's what this looks like to enter a new one. And again, this information is used. So, you know, when they submit their financial information, they submit, you know, all of the um, amounts that are associated with their accounts. Well, the account codes are coded um, by OPU to refer to certain buildings. Um, you know, they have certain expenses that might be tied to like elementary, um, that sort of thing. So, Having these different percentages and having their square footage helps put in context some of their expenditures when that's analyzed by ODE. So this is important. Um, and then speaking of OPUs, uh, if we hop over to the, uh, that was the core menu, OPU. And then here is where they actually have the OPU portion of their account codes. Um, this is defined um, by their district, so um, any of the OPUs they use, a description, and the IRN specifically for that building, and the, the 00, this is a demo instance, but this would be the district IRN, not the junior high, <laughs> but the 0 is always going to be the district. Um, so yes, so they can review these. I mean, chances are they're probably utilizing these throughout the year. So um, again, this is just, you know, review this, make sure that, that these are all accurate and what they want to report because these are included for what's reported with their financials.
Okay. So we did the profiles. Um, this so there is like a template report as well for this district and building information we looked at the one from the grid personally i kind of like the one from the grid because it's right there you know it's very simple information but this is available too ah um so let's talk about the account validation report so let's go to i'm going to go to our report manager And it's right here, account validation report. Here, let me do this. Account validation report. So let's go ahead and run this. Now, what this is going to do, so, you know, those account codes um, are all defined, um, you know, primarily from the USAS manual. Um, you know, what the different pieces of the account code stand for, which ones are available to use. And um, so with that, when they get reported to ODE, it's going to, you know, use those account codes to determine, you know, um, certain information about the expenses associated with them. So um, this report makes sure that the um, codes in your system are accurate. And um, essentially, so what we're going to do, we're going to run this a couple different ways. When we go to this query options, there's one option here and it says, do I want to exclude accounts with zero amounts? So the first time I run this, I'm going to leave this blank because that way we can see what this report looks like. But um, when, when the information is reported, the accounts that have amounts are what is going to be looked at for the reporting. So um, essentially, if we have any wrong accounts, we want to move the amounts out of those, whether we use like an account change um, or if it's just an expense, we could use like an um, error correction distribution. And so there are some options for updating these accounts, but uh, let's go ahead, let me run this and we'll keep talking about it here. So um, this first copy I'm looking at, you know, if I'm going to, I'm just looking at all accounts right now, so we can kind of see what sort of errors this, this throws. Zoom in here. So here's what these look like. So here's like a cash account, cash account, and it's saying, all right, this is not a valid fund code. So if we go look that up, um, in like the USAS manual, you know, there's something wrong with these fund codes, you know, maybe they're no longer used. Um, or, I mean, this is a test instance, so who knows with these, but um, usually that would be the case. Uh, and then look, we have, you know, this is not a valid function. So this report will tell you, you know, the specific part of the code um, that needs to be looked at if there is an issue. Receipt code is not at a valid level of detail. So um, maybe this receipt code, you know, needs to also have a subject or an OPU. Um, if you do go look that up um, in the USS man, you can um, find out um, additional information or the ODE EMIS manual also has some information as well. So, um, Basically, this is just a really helpful tool to make sure these accounts are um, valid and set to go. Now, um, if we come back here to run this again, the thing is, though, that it's only going to look at accounts that have amounts. So if I filter in my test instance and say, you know, any accounts that are all zeros, I want to exclude those. Let me generate this. Take a minute. No data returned. So all of my accounts, what this tells me is that all of my accounts that actually have amounts with them are fine. So this is good. Um, let's go back here. So uh, this gives you just kind of the description. So make sure the district has no invalid accounts prior to using the data collector to check for the level one or two errors. Here's your examples of those errors that we saw. 
Um, and then we have some other warning messages that are listed here. So um, we saw something like this with the receipt. Um, some other messages that they might get when validating the information. Ah, you know what? I'm going to take this one off. We'll talk about this EMIS category later. But let's sneaky delete that. Um, I think we're going to talk about it here very soon. <laughs> So ODE requires the OPU to be entered. Um, and so uh, if we do have a note here that if the district receives one of these errors and it's a fatal, um, if there is something that they need to change, say they need to run an account change um, related to the year, or like say they just need to enter a distribution error correction to uh, change something with, with an account that's fatal. After the fiscal year is closed, June is able to be reopened to make necessary changes for this. So that is an option. And then here is your page showing account change. So, you know, if they have accounts with amounts that do show up on this report, they can go in and um, it's under utilities and run account change. All righty. Well, we're cruising right along here. So let's talk about these cash records next. So this is what I sneaky deleted. Here's the thing. Um, so cash records are reported via EMS, um, but they used to have this, uh, the brief, uh, brief description, it was the fund category code. So we've actually had like kind of a note on here regarding the fund, uh, the fund category for like the EMIS fund category for a couple of years because we were, um, you know, trying to figure out like, you know, if it was optional or like how they were using that. Um, so in the meantime, like, you know, districts were kind of like adding that if they wanted to and that sort of thing. Uh, per the ODE website, um, the ODE brief description is set to be removed for fiscal year 23 financial reporting. Um, so that's why I deleted it off of that previous slide because um, those fund categories are no longer officially no longer being looked at um, based on the information in, in the current um, EMIS manual. So, yeah, so one less thing to worry about. Um, if they had those on their accounts, you know, because it is kind of like a little description, like it's not going to hurt anything. It's just not actually being, you know, so it's not like they have to do anything or go delete anything on there. It's just not being pulled in like the EMIS pull anymore. And then here, the operational units, this is the OPUs that we looked at. So we kind of sneak peek looked at those ahead of time. Um, we have a page here for appropriations. So again, this is where I mentioned that budgeting scenario steps. So um, where uh, they're at this time of year. So um, the for the budgeting, okay. So for budgeting, they would have created their scenarios. The scenarios is where they're going to enter their next year proposed budgets and revenues. That's where they start to compile everything. Um, the, at this point, they're probably wanting to get around um, the point where they can promote those to the proposed amounts grid. The proposed amounts grid is when they'll show as next year proposed. So that's when it'll have next year proposed on the account uh, for those budgeted amounts. And, um, you know, that'll get them to the point where they can start entering their requisitions um, and get that set for next year. Um, before the end of the fiscal year um, or after, but usually they like to do it before um, so that it's like ready to go, but it's not like a hard line they have to, is um, actually applying those budgets from the proposed grid will get those out there so they'll be set and ready to go as initials when they switch to July. Um, and I'm totally just giving you a really brief overview of this process here. But um, again, uh, February 2023 was our budgeting 2023 uh, session, and uh, that whole recording is out there available where we go through these steps in detail. So um, if you haven't seen that already, definitely check that out. Um, and here's a, here's a link to that walkthrough as well. All right. 
So I mentioned prepare requisitions. Um, so if they go ahead and open July 2023, sorry, 2023 ahead of time, they can create transactions in that future period. So if they want to be making requisitions that have a July 1 date, um, if they go to their posting periods, create that July period, they don't have to make it current. So like they can still be in May and just have July also out there open. And then that would allow them to go ahead and have um, their district uh, personnel be able to create requisitions uh, you know, with that date. So that's definitely possible. Uh, if the district doesn't typically do requisitions, can they do POs in July 2023 instead? Yes, they can. Um, again, same rules. July needs to be um, created and open for them to be able to post those POs with the July 1 date. Great question. Okay. So let's see. Yeah, all right. Well, we are to the month end closing. So this part is where we get really standard. You know, this is really their typical month end closing process. Um, so they would balance all transactions for the month of June um, and then, you know, reconcile the USAS records with their bank records. Um, you know, again, nothing different from like their normal month to month with this part. Uh, we recommend generating the cash summary, comparing that to the financial detail. So the cash summary is going to be a summary of the account, the account totals, and the financial detail is compiling the transactions. Um, and when they compare those totals, those should balance for the um, received amounts and the expended amounts. And then um, when those totals, uh, if those totals balance, um, you know, once they're balanced, set to go, they would proceed. We have a slide here about the monthly reports. Noah mentioned earlier the potential for custom uh, bundles, but um, as far as uh, the standard month end reports, like um, they can manually run and review like any that they, you know, kind of typically would, or if they want, if they have certain reports they save. We do have the standard monthly reports uh, that will run um, as long as it's enabled, will run when they close that. Um, you know, coming up here in, in the next part when they close June, that will automatically run, send to their archive, just like normal. All right. So here are the steps that are actually like more specific to the fiscal year and closing part. So the first thing that we're going to do is come in here and look at some of these um, things that happen on the periodic menu. So I'm going to periodic. First, let's stop in and look at a cash reconciliation. So um, if I come in here and create a cash reconciliation, now I know some districts use this all the time. Some of them use this month to month. You know, they're all, they always come in here, create their cash reconciliation. Some districts might not. Some districts might, you know, have their own reconciliation in like Excel or, you know, however they do it. For the end of the fiscal year, they do need to make one for June. So, you know, if they use this all the time, then perfect. It's their normal process. If they don't, then they at least need to make one. Oops, should pick June. <laughs> then they need to make one for June because this is part of what goes with the financial, um, the financial reporting um, to ODE. So uh, they just come in here. Oh my goodness, sorry, I clicked too many things. <laughs> uh, they would grab the posting period that they're creating this for from this dropdown and then come in here and they can add, um, oh my gosh, okay. and then um, add, and then like enter another one, or if they have these in here, they would come in here and edit these amounts. Um, and then basically um, these amounts would get tracked over here per what they entered. And as I scroll down um, at the bottom here, look, I'm sorry, let me expand this. 
At the bottom here, I have total entered balance, which is going to be everything, you know, based on the boxes and information that I um, entered. And then the total fund balance is coming from my system. So this is my cash summary total fund balance. And these two should balance. Also helps them balance. <laughs> helps them balance their books to their bank. So um, double purpose on that one. So, okay, so they want to make sure they do that. So that's the first thing. And then um, they want to come in here and go to federal assistance summary. The summary has to be done first. So what we're going to do is um, come in here. And so in this case, I actually have my fiscal year 2023. So, but if I was creating this, you know, all I'd basically do is come in here, enter the year, if I wanted to enter a comment um, and then just save this up. So this step is like really easy. It just basically sets up um, everything that we're going to attach the records to in the next step. So we have to have this first. And then um, next we're going to federal assistance detail. Let's see. Ah, uh, oh, good tip, Dee. So, um, so I have a chat and this is about the cash reconciliation. So um, she says that when entering the outstanding checks, it is entered as a negative. Um, if they aren't used to this, they may assume when entering it that it subtracts, um, which uh, will cause out of balance. So good tip there. So um, here, let, I'm going to switch back just so we can look at, we have a little visual here. So um, we're talking about on this cash reconciliation. And um, let's see, isn't there a little box for that, right? It's on the right-hand side, go up. Ah, that's but what, you do okay. Have to actually see. enter, yeah, you have to actually enter that amount. There we go, there we go. Oh, thank you so much. I'm sorry, that's my gift for not making my window big. Appreciate it. Yes, so right here. Okay, awesome. Well, that's a great tip. Thank you very much. Okay. So let's hop back over. Um, so again, I'm on this federal assistance detail. And um, so on this one, what we can do here, so we have a couple options. So what they need to do is they need to enter lines for um, each of the, these, um, for their grant information. So for each CFDA number, they're going to enter a row here and they can create these. Is the federal assistance threshold still um, 750,000? You know what? I'm not sure what the threshold is. I don't know if anybody else is aware and can put it in chat. Um, I will share that, but I'm not, I'm not um, sure on their thresholds. If I see it out there. I'll read it out for you. Um, okay, so we, what we can do is we can either uh, create a brand new record here and um, the first thing we do is we pick the fiscal year. So this is, you know, the summary that we set up. So that's why we had to have it set up first. And uh, since these other ones are already for this year, <laughs> Uh, it's going to just automatically populate a line number. The line number is just to keep it in a list, basically. They would enter the CFDA number, enter the grant title, choose a cash account here. And you know what? I forgot to write down an example of one of these. So I think I just need it to be a certain number of digits. So I'm making one up um, for the number. Okay, so we'll do that. And then when we get to the cash account, okay, so we're gonna select one first that starts with a five. We're gonna select one of these funds here. And um, when I select this, when I tab down, I should have selected one with an amount. I'm so sorry, I, I uh, forgot to note an, an account that had amounts here and I apologize. So how this works is, um, for 500 funds, when this cash account is selected here, what the software is going to do 
is it's going to go look at uh, the actual like cash um, account information and it'll populate these. Let's let me go to uh, I want to try and show this. I'm so sorry. We're doing a couple things on the fly here. We're going to go run a cash summary and see if we can find one of these. This should just take a second, but I think it'll be much easier to see what's happening here. Oops. Had it filtered. Okay. So um, while we're waiting for this to run, I see in the chat we have, yes, according to OMB Circular, um, A133, it is still 750000 or more in federal funds per year. Awesome. Thank you, Pat. Okay, a little bit of scrolling here. I just want to come down to my 500 funds. Oh, boy. Do we have anything? Okay, let's try this one. Wait, let's see. Yes, let's try this one. Okay, perfect. Let me just start over here just to make sure I get this right. Okay, 2023. We're gonna put in a fake number here, but this is where they'd enter the CFDA number. Oh, uh, the other thing I wanna point out. So if they aren't sure about these, so if they're not sure about like like me, you know, I'm saying, okay, where, you know, where am I getting this from? I'm just gonna make one up, but obviously they need to put in a real one. If they hover over, this is going to give them the website that they can go to, to see the current list of these numbers. Um, and then the grant titles has it too. So that's a very helpful tip if they um, aren't sure. Okay, let me put this in here and then see now once I picked that, it automatically put these figures in at the bottom here. So this is what I wanted to show. I think that does, I think that was worth going to um, grab that. The one thing I wanna note, we changed this between last year and this year is these figures that show at the bottom now, if this if this cash account, this fund had any transfers in or transfers out, those are no longer included in the numbers, which um, based on the feedback we had, it shouldn't be, you know, it's people didn't want that to be included um, because this is, you know, supposed to actually show the federal contributions and the federal expenditures. So, um, you know, if if they've used this in previous years and they went and checked for transfers and then manually took them out, um, that should make this a lot easier for them uh, going forward. So let's save that one up. We'll add one here. The other uh, way that they can do this. So, uh, you know, obviously all of these that I have in here right now are for fiscal year 23, which let me move this over so I can see that. These are all 23, but if I had previous years, so like as you go, like the the um, records will stay out here from previous years, they could come in, view one of their records from last year and then clone it. And then, you know, make that for this year instead. So that is an option if they use these year to year and then just go ahead and, you know, update the amounts. The other thing to note is that that fun little trick that I showed with entering the cash account and having those amounts populated is specific to the fund accounts that start with five, the 500s. So um, for non 500 funds, the figures won't automatically populate. Um, however, they can use an account filter. So like we see this one has an account filter on here. And um, so this was selected um, and then it will, uh, pull the received and expended amounts consistent with that filter. So that is an option if they have something like that, um, or they could just manually enter the figures to what they need it to be, um, and that, that can happen too. 
So that's our federal assistance detail. And then uh, the next one we're going to talk about on here is the civil civil proceedings. And um, so again, this is just like if they need to report these, uh, they can come in here fiscal year um, and enter any information um, you know that they may need to enter. Um, so they don't necessarily have to have this if they don't have any civil proceedings, like they don't have to have these. They can still extract. They don't get any error when they're like extracting from our software. Um, I believe they may still get a warning in like on the EMA side to say like, hey, you don't have any of these. Do you mean to not have any of these? You know, but I, you know, they should be able to proceed past that. So, um, so it's possible that uh, they may get something stating that. But, you know, again, if they don't have any, what are they going to do? <laughs> so, um, so yes. So if they have these, this is where they'd enter them. Okay. All right. So uh, let, let's move on here. So we have all this information entered now. And then this next part is about the, um, basically the EMIS extract. So we're looking at a lot of this information that is going to be pulled and submitted with ODE. Um, and there are, I think I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I have a slide that'll that we'll jump into with that. So let me, let me put the brakes on here. Um, so basically, when we do, uh, when it's going to go ahead and connect to uh, the data collector, what we want to make sure is that the EMIS SOAP service uh, configuration is set to the correct fiscal year. So let's go back here. I'm going to go to system configuration. And the EMIS SOAP service configuration right here, it's very simple and it's just, you know, you just go enter the fiscal year. Now, here's the thing. So I can go in, put this in here. Um, you know, if they've reported in prior years, like this may be set or switched over. Um, this can stay fiscal year 2023 for some time. So we're going to look at um, we have like their current schedules for the timelines of the EMIS reporting, and it's not immediate. So as long as this is set to 2023, they can move on into their new fiscal year. They can be processing in 2024, but this will still allow the data collector to be pulling the 2023 information after the fact. So we want to set this to 2023 now. Um, that said, you know, it could still be 2022 if they did their 22 reporting and then never switched it over. So it's good to check this, make sure this is set to the proper year. And then the next two slides we have um, are like ITC, uh, more ITC based information about connecting to uh, the SOAP service for EMIS. So um, we have uh, this information here, there's a link that um, gives more information about configuring the SOAP service. And basically, uh, the first thing is that year that we looked at. The second part is that um, a user would be created and given this EMIS SIF uh, um, role. And here's where it shows like basically what the URLs are for an instance. And essentially you would take those two pieces of information and plug those into the SOAP connection for the SIF setup. Now, I believe this only needs to be done once. So if you've done this in previous years, I think you're good to go. But um, you know, if there is a new district that maybe hasn't connected to the data collector yet, this is the information you want to follow for that. OK. Okay, so then if we hop back to the um, the part you're going to do in USAS, we're going to come over here and we are going to go to, oops, I guess I can't stay zoomed in here. We're going to go to extracts and we're going to go to EMIS. 
And then, so what we see here is we have um, the information. We can pick the year that we want to extract, and we can go ahead and generate this extract file. Now, look, here is where I start to get some warnings and warning no cash reconciliation. They don't have civil proceedings entry. So the cash reconciliation I would definitely want to go do. But this is nice because if they extract this too early and they don't have the things in there yet that they intend to, this will let them know. Um, but for the sake of our example, we're going to pretend we didn't see this and say it has everything we want. Um, and then let's see. And then um, here's our file. So let me open this. And obviously this doesn't look super pretty, but this is just a data file that's gonna get loaded in, but just to kind of give you a little glance. So, you know, it's gonna have that um, information um, of the district, but here's where, so this was like our federal information that we saw in that grid. So that's being included in here. Uh, you can see, look at, we have the building square foot, the lunchroom percentages, um, et cetera. Here's the central office square footage. So like this little file contains all that information that we went and just looked over. So um, that's the basics of, of um, what they're pulling out with this one. Um, shouldn't these be errors rather than warnings? So... Yeah, so then um, Vicky says it can't be an error because those districts do not have any civil proceedings. Um, so the civil proceedings, definitely a warning. The cash reconciliation, I'll have to double check. I am I think when they get to the EMA stage, they do need to have the cash rec information in there. Um, so I do understand the point about that being a warning. So I'll double check on that. Um, you know, but I guess there could be a situation where it's still going to like extract it if they're, you know, going to do their validations ahead of time and they just want to have that in there to be able to check, like, because an error is going to usually prevent something from happening. So if it's an error, then they like wouldn't even be able to get the extract file versus a warning. It's going to tell you, hey, you need more information, um, but but you can still have this file. So, you know, then when, if they were to take that and load that to the data collector, then they may actually get an error at that point for the things that they definitely have to have. So. Um, that so, is correct, Amanda. It's, okay. It all has to do with that early collection. Okay. Collection in June before they close, it's going to generate that warning because obviously they're not done for the year yet. So you're correct. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michelle. Okay. Alrighty, so, so then, so what they do with this file, so, and, and we're kind of, kind of getting there with this conversation, but so what they're going to do with this file is they're going to take that SEQ file that we just looked at in Notepad, they're going to take it, save it to their computer, and then they're going to upload that into the data collector for their period age reporting, for their financials, and then once they um, once they upload that, it'll be used in combination with that SIF connection. So that's the data collector, collector connection that we talked about with um, in those previous slides. And that's all going to be used to pull in their information. And here's the slide I was looking for is um, so the EMIS extract, that file we just pulled, and then here are the things that includes. Um, the SIF agent will pull the other period age files. So the cash expenditure and revenue accounts. So that's the account codes. That's what's been expended on them. The receipt, like the actual totals and amounts, um, the account data, and then the OPUs is all coming over with the SIF connection. Okay. And then, you know what? I thought I had a slide here. Ah, it's at the end, okay. I have a slide where we're gonna talk about the timeline for those reporting. So we'll get to that a little bit later, but um, that's where we can kind of hop back to talking about, you know, when those actually happen versus like the preliminary um, that we're talking about, you know, maybe they would want to do this in advance to start reviewing things. 
But for now, let's stick with our uh, uh, fiscal year end process. So uh, now they've got the EMIS places that they need in place for reporting. They pull that extract. Um, and then now uh, what we're looking at is their fiscal year end reports. So this is the part where they start their balancing. So they can manually run and review any of the reports um, that, that they may use for balancing. Uh, there is also a fiscal year reports bundle that will run automatically when the period is closed, and that's going to save those reports um, for them in their file archive. And then we have a tip here, you know, it's good to wait until the bundle is complete before changing the current period to a new period, um, specifically if they have custom report bundles scheduled. So, you know, we talked earlier where they could set up if they wanted monthly uh, bundles to run monthly that were like custom. They can also um, schedule for the fiscal period close completed. So they could have a custom uh, fiscal bundle as well. So if they have anything in addition to the standard SSDT bundles, that's specifically when they're gonna wanna make sure that those bundles complete before changing the current period to a new one. And they can view that in the file archive um, by uh, clicking on the row and then the reports pop up over in the detail view on the side. Okay. This next slide, I have a list of um, just like all the reports that are gonna be included in the fiscal year end bundle. The thing that's interesting about this is that, you know, we have the monthly reports that run and some of those monthly reports, uh, you know, show things that are, so basically like we didn't duplicate any reports that would already be in the monthly reports bundle. So you will have a June monthly report bundle and then also the fiscal year report bundle. So these ones are specifically things that either are run for complete fiscal start stop dates or, um, you know, things that wouldn't show uh, like the full range of the fiscal year on something included in, Ju in just June. Um, and then also you can see we have these different reports for um, like the civil proceedings, federal assistance. So those, um, EMIS related reports are included as well as some um, auditor extracts. All right. So now everything's entered. Um, we've got the fiscal year in balance. Um, all the reports look good and they're ready to close. So here are their steps. So the first one we have on here is creating July 2023. So they might already have this created. We talked about earlier, if they want to enter requisitions or POs ahead of time, they could create that July period. Honestly, if they went and applied their budgets, it would have created July. So they might already have July out there and that's okay. If they don't, they can create July uh, 2023 and um, have that ready to go. And then they go ahead, close June with uh, the, the close icon. And then that's when the monthly and the fiscal um, bundles are going to run. And let's just for good measure, go look at this in our software. So core, posting periods. And so here's July, that's created, excellent. Um, and then I have the close icon for June. Now in order to close June, I am going to have to close any other open periods that um, are in my fiscal year before I'll be able to close June. So, you know, if they are somebody that has multiple periods that they leave open for a bit, like they'll go through, close those, um, you know, I'd definitely make sure that they give adequate time for the bundles to run each time they close them. But, um, you know, essentially what they're ultimately going to do is close this and then they can make July current um, after closing those. I'm not gonna close those all right now just because I'm not sure what bundles I have set up in here and I don't wanna start hitting my system, <laughs> but, um, but that's the general idea. So, okay. Okay, so then, you know, yeah, once the bundles are complete, make July, 2023 current and um, you are now closed for the month and the fiscal year. Will it give you an error if you try to close June before May is closed? Yes, I believe it does. Yes, so here, let's, I guess we can do this. Oh, I do have my bundles disabled. 
here we go. Cannot close June. All the other posting periods in this fiscal year must be closed prior to closing June. So it does definitely let them know. Yes. And really, and so I would say, like, especially if you have some bigger districts, like when June gets closed, like I would say, you know, try and like give that one a minute. So, you know, I know when you're kind of closing these periods, like we talk about the monthly bundles that run, you know, it's switching, like if new transactions can be put in that month, but especially with June, like there are calculations that are happening when that period closes, like it's taking all of those ending balances and moving those over as starting balances for the new year. So I would say like that one especially is good, you know, when they're closing that to, you know, not necessarily just close that, open the new one, move on, start process, you know what I mean? Like give, have them plan to maybe give it, give it a minute, you know, <laughs> give it, even if it's just like, you know, five, 10 minutes, like just let it process and do its thing. Um, and we do have the message that pops up and shows you that it's still processing, um, but just kind of good to plan for and, and just know that there's, you know, a bit more calculation happening with, with that one. All right. Okay. Okay, boom. So the fiscal year is closed. Um, and so that's all set to go. Uh, the post, uh, sorry, the post closing procedures are this last little section that we want to talk about here. And the first thing on this list is the district audit job for the auditor of state. Now these were new last year. So we had these on here. I you know um, a lot of you have probably uh, been in to schedule these. So um, basically instead of like that auditor bundle that um, we recently removed, we have these audit jobs that can be found in the job scheduler. And the district audit job, um, it, it, need, it needs to be scheduled, um, asterisk, unless it's already scheduled. So this is the thing. So here are the steps, like here's what this audit job includes. And then um, here are the steps for like actually going in and creating one of these. But I, I put this note on here because if these were set up last year by either you at the ITC or if the district scheduled these last year, if you used a cron job and have this set so that it's set up for every single, you know, to continue running on the same day every year, this may already be scheduled. So what I would suggest is going in and reviewing that job scheduler to make sure that the next run date, you know, is showing for a date that, um, you know, for when they want it to run next, which is probably like they might have it set, you know, during their audit time. Um, I think AOS was working um, you know, with everyone to kind of say like, hey, I want your reports to come in at this point in time. Um, so yeah, so so essentially like this may not be going in and creating a job again if they already have it set up to run every year. All right. And now we are back to the financial data reporting. So we talked a lot about, you know, all the steps beforehand that they set up to get that extract and um and to do here but um just as far as the actual submission to ODE uh it's done through EMSR um we it's a responsibility of the district to make sure that they submit this um so basically an authorized person in the district whether that would be an EMIS coordinator or the treasurer will upload the flat file the flat file is that EMIS.seq that we pulled out of the software earlier so they'll take that, upload it to the data collector, and then um, they run the data collection process. Ooh, do I have one? Oh, I see a note that I should say 23, not 22. On the slide that you're on. Ah, yes, you're right, thank you. I missed one, yeah, we do, I re we review these each year, but you know, sometimes we miss those. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure that, I'm sure, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I know you all update your materials year to year for uh, the closes too. So, <laughs> um, but thank you very much. All right. So, um, 
Okay, so upload the fat, flat file. They're going to run that data collection process and then submit it to um, ODE. And uh, yes, must be sent to ODE before period age closes for fiscal year 23. Uh, and then we have our nice little reminder that as of fiscal year 20, uh, which, wow, <laughs> um, cap that seems like this happened just yesterday. Capital assets are no longer needed and not to be included in the data collection. So we're just doing the financials, no worry for um, inventory capital asset submission. Um, and then, so this is the slide that I was looking for earlier. So um, I have this on here. This was just as of when I pulled it, but definitely check ODE's website for these officially. Um, so they post EMIS data collection calendars. And yeah, the last time I looked here is, um, so financial collection, uh, I believe this is like when the windows open. So from June 1st until um, August 30th. So this is where when we're kind of talking about, okay, they might pull, it might not be the complete information, but they might go start running things out there. So if they start running those maybe in June, and then they could flag things like, you know, if they do have invalid accounts or like if there's anything else that they need to address, they can start getting those level one and two errors from um, from the data collector so that they can make updates before they actually submit their final before August. So, yes. Okay. Okay, and then, you know, kind of just some more information written out here on what we're talking about. They upload the sequential file. And then the rest of the information um, based on that SOAP service configuration that we set to 2023, that's what's going to tell um, SIF that it should pull uh, the information uh, from the uh, accounts. And so uh, that's going to work together to, to pull that information over. Okay. We also have the gap extract. So the gap extract from the extracts menu to um, create the file for gap reporting. And this is uh, these extracts are like very simple. Um, so we'll go back and we'll take a look at this. But as you can see here, you select the fiscal year and then submit, and that's going to generate the extract. Um, I do also want to note like the EMIS extract too. You could just pick the year. So on these ones where you can pick the year, it doesn't necessarily have to be like your current year or your open year. So like this gap export, this is a post-closing thing. So I could be, you know, in July and then go ahead and extract. I could be in July, which is fiscal year 24, but I could still come in here and select the fiscal year for 2023 and pull it for that that prior fiscal year information. So when I have these drop downs, that lets me, uh, you know, just pick the information for that year. Okay, and then um, so here's the web gap uh, links, and um, that is about it for USAS. So, do we have any questions? Amanda, can you hear me? Yes. I just wanted to point out, um, and, and I see in JIRA that this is going to be fixed in 8.74, okay. but we had an issue where um, last year somebody did account change in June as part of like the account validation uh, process, and it opened July, and they didn't want it to open July. I can give you the JIRA number like if, if that would be helpful for people. It looks like USSR 5023. So just maybe, maybe some caution for people that they that that might happen to them. Um, it looks like, I, from what I can tell in the notes of that Jira request, it, it seems like it's going to be fixed. Mm -hmm. But so some people want July to be open, right? They're doing it on purpose for the next year recs and POs. So we have one district that's happened too, and they didn't care, right? They were like, okay, the account change did it for me, you know. But the yeah. other district freaked out because she's more old school, you know, and she did not want July open. So um, just as a heads up for everybody gotcha. that until that gets released, whenever that 874 is supposed to happen, that that, that may happen to you. 
That's a, that's a good one. Yeah, I know we did discuss that with the developers recently. So we we um you know review issues like that and try and get them in before fiscal year end if we can. And I believe that. One, oh, thank you, Pat. So um so that one. Yeah, if it's I believe it's specifically if they do it in June and then it creates July and um you know it is one where it's like yeah so it kind of depends on their situation right because if they have posted budgets already and they already have july uh then you know it's not gonna be so so it, yeah, it's, it's not a, really a big deal that most but, most people won't care but we have right. a handful which i'm sure lots of people have some people that are still old school in it and they don't want to do anything in july yeah gotcha well that's a really great heads up thank you for bringing that up and then seven four is uh seven four is scheduled for june 2nd right now so um oh that's great yeah hopefully that timing will also prevent that as well so so good one okay um and i'm so sorry michelle i realized i went like way past my time <laughs> um but uh do we have any more questions on usas before we switch over michelle or i mean i just wanted to clarify that what you just said a little bit on um, a couple slides back so you don't have to be current in June in order to run those reports that have those drop downs. That's correct, right? The extracts, yeah. Okay. So like this, this gap extract and then the EMIS extract, they can pull that and just select the year because so and if we um, think about like when we did, uh, we were looking at that grid for the um, federal assistance, those all had a year that were that was um, selected with that and then we entered the figures. So because of how that's set up, it's able to just say, I want everything for this year. So you can you can still pull that um, after the fact. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, I have one more thing for you, Sass. I'll make this quick uh, before we switch over. Um, so we do have some upcoming uh, Fridays with Fiscal. I just pulled the USAS ones here. But um, so June 16th, we have one um, that's going to cover account change and account modifications. And so especially, you know, talking about some account change stuff, like we thought that might be a good time for it right before the end of the fiscal year. Um, and then July 21st, we have common errors and troubleshooting where we're going to kind of go through and talk about the things that, you know, we look at to help troubleshoot issues um, and kind of, you know, give you some tools for where you can look um, and then go through the common errors. And then in August, we're going to do a report generation, best practices. I know reports is always something that you guys want to hear about. So we have that on the schedule coming up as well. Okay. Okay. I'm done. Michelle, what do you think? You want to um, get rolling? You want to do a break? Let's do it. Let's give them a, a stretch here. I'll give them a chance to stretch and stuff. So how about if we just give them like a five, five minute break? Okay with everybody. And then we'll come back and talk about inventory. Get your second or third cup of coffee. Sounds good. Well, thank you, everyone. Okay, I have I have resumed recording, making sure everyone can hear me okay. Um, good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody again. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to dig into the inventory fiscal year and review. And um, the first thing, um, down here in our um, fiscal year end materials is I have the link to the presentation and also um, the link to the checklist in the wiki. And so obviously if I need to make any uh, changes um, in the PowerPoint, I'm, I'm not so sure about my years too, if I had them all updated to reflect um, fiscal year 23. Um, and if I need to make any changes, I will, and I'll update the updated uh, column here um, with my new changes. So, um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to switch over to the agenda or to the presentation right, right now. And all you're seeing right now is the agenda. So let me switch over. Okay. Hopefully everybody can see this okay. And so um and I just was in the uh, where we have all this information at. And so what we're going to talk about first is the pre-closing steps. Um, and so what we have here is um, just some things that you need to look for um, when it comes to actually um, closing the fiscal year. 
Um, just making sure too, if everyone can see my screen okay, you guys can send it in chat and just let me know um, that you're seeing the actual PowerPoint. All right, awesome. Okay, and so um, what you need to do in order to prepare for closing for inventory, and just to step back a minute, we did make quite a few changes in the checklist that's out there on the wiki and the PowerPoint presentation, just because we had um, when we did this session last year, it was before a lot of those changes were made for fiscal year end. So I made a lot of notation last year about it will be on this year issue or this year issue will be released, you know, in July and something like that and stuff like that. So. Michelle, I'm sorry to interrupt. I think that the, there was a message, um, the, uh, this PowerPoint, it wasn't out on your um, fiscal year end link. So I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be or not. Yeah, when you click on it, that one that says ITC inventory fiscal year end review, it's the agenda. Seriously, I put the wrong thing out there. My goodness. Hold on for a moment. Let me get that uh, fixed for you guys real quick. Thank you. Sure. E-G-I-F. <laughs> I feel for you. I feel for you. I can feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> Let me get logged in here. I want to get that third cup of coffee. Sounds like I need one too. All right, let me edit this. Now check it and see if it's out there. I think I got it. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thanks, you guys. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay, let's start over. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the uh, pre-closing steps first, uh, now that you guys can follow along with me. Um, so uh, first off is finish all their current year processing for inventory. So um, any items that were received on or prior to June 30th of 2023 should be added to inventory for fiscal year 23. They want to show that, you know, they acquired it, they purchased it in 2023. They went it on the books uh, for 23. Um, items that were that were received after uh, June 30th um, can be added to the inventory uh, pending file. So those can get pulled in and just sit out there until they're ready to start processing for 24. Um, so same as it's always been uh, when it comes to those. Um, if depreciation has been changed on several items and it's necessary or the district has discussed this, discussed this with their auditors um, to recalculate the life to date by going in and using the depreciate option on the items grid, uh, they can do so as well. And what that does is that resets it. So, um, you know, the depreciation was 10000 and it wasn't correct. And they go in and use that depreciate option on the grid to recalculate depreciation. Um, it's gonna go out there and totally recalculate that depreciation figure. And so when you look at that figure, um, when you actually go into an item and uh, you view it or edit it, um, that depreciation transaction is going to show the new figure. So if they had done like, um, closed out, you know, a couple of years now um, on a particular item, it's always going to show an internal adjustment. Let me go into one of these so I can kind of show you what I'm talking about here. 
Okay, so if I go into items, what I'm talking about is the depreciate option here. Um, if they need to go in and recalculate depreciation, um, and like I said, this is kind of a reset button. And obviously they can go in and select specific ones. Um, so they can create a filter of the items that they need to depreciate. Um, and then they can use the depreciate option. And like I said, that does have a projection option um, that they can see what the before and after will be. And if they go and run through the actual then, um, it's going to reset their depreciation, recalculate it um, based on the current data. And what I mean by that, if I go in and just view one of these, I'm going to click on the first one here. And I'm going to go down to the depreciation transactions. Um, and so if they run the depreciate, it's going to go out there and just recalculate based on where they are at right now. So if the original cost is 36,2450, the life is five years. And the beginning date is, is you know, uh, November of 2000, it's going to take that information and recalculate uh, the depreciation with this information. It doesn't care if in fiscal year 22, you did an additional acquisition onto this item, thus increasing the original cost. It's not gonna take like that audit trail of you know what was what had happened to that item throughout the years. Um, it's not going to take that into consideration. It's just going to look at what is it now? What's my original cost now? What was my beginning depreciation date and how many years do I have? And it's going to do that calculation based off of that. Um, this was something that we did um, go through uh, when we did the inventory overview. And I I have linked some of that information on there under the PowerPoint in case the ITC or the district wants to learn more about how the depreciate option works. But if it's something where they do need to go in, recalculate depreciation, you know, this is kind of the, the fields that it's looking at. And then what happens is, is under the depreciate transactions, there's going to be an internal um, depreciation transaction that's made with the new life to date amount. And that amount listed in here is going to match the life to date amount sitting up in here. So um, that's how that is intended to work. Um, so that's basically something, I'll go back to my PowerPoint here. Um, so that's basically how that works. So like I said, it's not looking at the whole history of what had happened to that item along the way. It's just looking at what is it now? I'm gonna recalculate depreciation because it wasn't calculating properly to begin with. And when I do that, it's basically resetting it. And here are the links that I'm talking about, um, the depreciation chapter in the appendix and the depreciation section um, in items um, kind of explains that more in detail. And I don't have the video listed here as well, but um, if you um, go into the inventory overview and we uh, talked about depreciation on that third day, um, there's some information to that goes into that more detail. Okay. So another thing too, um, and this has just always been past practice um, when we always went through inventory, even when um, we did EIS, we went through this and we just wanted to make sure that the districts are making sure that their entities capitalization thresholds are marked correctly, that those items are marked correctly. Um, for those ones that are to be capitalized. And one way to check that is on the items grid, um, if the capitalized column isn't on there already, they can go to the more and select it so that it is displayed. And then they can leave that alone, but go in and filter uh, by their cap threshold. So I have an example down here. And if their cap threshold was $5,000 and a life expectancy of a year, they could filter any items, active items, um, with original cost um, greater than 499. So that's going to include 5,000 and up, and also the life expectancy greater than zero because their life expectancy is one year or higher. And then what should happen then is that any items that are, you know, those should be capitalized um, because of the capitalization filter. 
uh, that I put in place. And they all should say true. So if there are some that say false, um, then those need to be looked into as to why those aren't showing as capitalized. So this is just kind of like a pre-check um, just in, to ensure um, that the cap thresholds are correct. So just one more thing to check. So when all of their items um, have been entered for fiscal year 23, um, they're at the point where they're ready to close for the year. Um, there are a recommended list of reports, um, including any necessary gap reports if, they're, if they, uh, um, their gap flag is enabled. Um, so all those fiscal year reports are explained in these next slides here. So the first one is the fixed asset uh, by source. Um, and so by source is the key word on this. Um, this is going to contain the original cost of the capitalized items by their source or fund the items were charged to on the purchase order. So it's looking at the acquisition information and it's looking at the fund that was used. Um, and we went through a whole explanation on how this report works um, and the source, um, depending on if a fund is on the account code. Um, we explained all of that um, during our inventory overview. And I do have the recording down here. This takes you right to that section of the recording that discusses the fixed asset by source with the slideshow and everything. So visually, you can see how this report is working. Um, so if you need more information about this, you can go to, to that recording and review that information. Um, but yes, it's going and looking at the acquisition information tied to that, the PO information to identify that source fund, and then it's going to place it on that report properly. So the report name is fixed asset by, by source report.pdf. Um, so that's basically the first, one of the first of the four gap reports that need to be run. It doesn't have like a bunch of different options. You're basically just going in, running the report, generating it, and that's it. The next one is the fixed asset by function and class. And this is a schedule of the fixed assets by the function and class code, but it has three different report formats. So you can schedule it to run by function and class, or just run it by class, or do a summary schedule by function and class. That option is going to allow you to summarize it by a two-digit function. Um, and then you have the option in that particular one um, in order to generate it by original cost or generate the report by book value. So for um, audit, they've always recommended to gener generate this report for all three formats. So just to go back quickly to show you where that's at here. I'll fix it out of here. I'll go up to my gap reports and I'm talking about the fixed asset by function and class. So again, here are the three different report options. And based on you know, what you select here, um, the first one, like I said, is the schedule. This will produce a report with original cost and book value. So book value is original cost minus total, de total depreciation. That's the book value. Um, and then the schedule by class. And then the last one is a summary schedule of the function class. And here's where I said you can go in and summarize this by a two-digit function. So it's just going to look at the first two digits of the function, and then you can choose, do I wanna generate the report, this report by book value, or do I wanna generate it by original cost? Um, so those are all the options in that one. And like I said, you do have the recording attached to this as well, um, where you can review specifically how this report is run and the three different ways that it can be run. Uh, the next one is a schedule of change in fixed assets. Um, and I'm kind of skipping the classic counterparts here. Um, I'm trying to, to, to wean us all off of that, but they are noted in here just to let you know what the classic counterpart was. And what a schedule of change is, is 
are the changes that were made in those capitalized assets during the current fiscal year. So um, you have the ability to generate a summary or a detail report. You can't run them both at the same time. So you can run the summary first, and then you can run the detail. Um, so also when you're running them, you can run them by asset class, fund, or function. And for the fiscal year for audit, it's recommended to generate the report for all three types. Um, and so I'm just gonna go back in and just show you where those are at again. I go back up to reports and go down to the schedule of change in fixed assets. Here's where you, know, you can run it by fund, function, or asset class. Um, and here's where you can either run it the summarized version, or if you uncheck this, you'll get the detailed version. So I've got a couple screenshots here of what these look like. Um, I guess one screenshot. So the top is the summary uh, schedule and the bottom is just a snippet of the detail schedule. So as you can see, this is a schedule of change. So this is going to show us what has happened with this, with based on how I'm sorting it, in this case by asset class, of what has happened throughout the year. Um, with, within that asset class. So obviously my beginning values again are my, my beginning original cost figures for all those capitalized assets. Any new assets that I've acquired during the year that are capitalized are going to be reflected in the acquisition amount. Anything I've disposed of during the current year will be reflected in the disposition. Any transfer transactions that I have um, made moving um, an item from one um, asset class to another uh, will be reflected in my transfer in and out columns, and then any adjustments. So if I made um, any adjustments, maybe I went in and created um, an item that really should have been done in a prior year, but I don't want to reopen the year. I just want to do it in, my, in the year that I'm currently in, um, and I go in and add that item, but I want to mark it. Instead of underneath the acquisition column, I want it to be reflected in the adjustment column. I can go into that acquisition and mark that error um, uh, checkbox. And what happens then is that will be reflected in my adjustment column. Some other things that we have made changes to this year is um, the cap threshold amounts. If they make changes to those before, those were going in and affecting beginning balances. We have, have stopped all type, hopefully stopped all types of issues where the beginning balances were being updated. Um, instead, those type of changes should be reflected in the adjustments column. That way that beginning balance will stay intact in order to um, balance to the prior year's ending balances on, these, on the same report. Um, and so it, it's going to make it much easier um, to track what's going on because what's nice is the summary report, any changes that have been made throughout the year are reflected on its detailed counterpart. So if I go in and I have a bunch of adjustments, you know, and I have, let's say, you know, $5,000 in there, well, what made up the $5,000? When I run the detail option, it's going to provide the tag numbers that make up that $5,000. So it'll be much easier for both the district and the auditors to see what has happened. If I just, you know, made changes to the beginning balance, we would have to find, figure out how, why is the beginning balance, you know, $5,000 less than it was in the prior year ending balance. Those are hard to find. So we, you know, wanted to stop that, uh, prevent that from being updated. So like I said, those are going to be reflected on the adjustment amount. It's going to be that way for the summary schedule in fixed assets and also for the, or the schedule of change and depreciation as well. Both of those reports, um, the beginning balance value should not be affected anymore. So with those first three reports that I talked about, fixed asset by source, the fixed asset by function and class, and the schedule of change, those all contain original cost amounts. I know a couple of the fixed asset by function may also have the book value, but 
those three also contain, they all contain the original cost. So they should balance each other too. So if they're running a one, sorry, I just said a 101. When they're running a fixed asset by source and comparing it to schedule a change in fixed assets, those total amounts should balance. Um, and we also have that um, an explanation of that in that overview recording. So I have that link in here as well that uh, discusses balancing those three reports. Um, the schedule of change and depreciation is the next one. And um, this is the changes in what took place in depreciation. So they're tracking depreciation for the year. Um, again, same similar format to this change in uh, fixed assets generate a summary or detail report, and we recommend to uh, run those for all the different uh, uh, sorts, asset class, fund, and function. And it also is going to have a, um, a, the summary option and the detail option. And if I just go down to the next one, just to show you um, the summary versus the detail here, again, uh, this was done by asset class, and it's showing me my depreciation figures. So this is what the depreciation was calculated or what it had at the beginning of the year for those capitalized assets that are marked for the depreciation. And then any items that haven't been fully depreciated yet um, that they're still getting their depreciation um, tracked will show up in the continuing items. And then obviously any new items that I've acquired this year that I'm tracking depreciation on are going to be reflected in the acquisition any items that I have disposed of this year that I'm tracking depreciation on, the depreciation is going to show up in the disposition, any transfers I've done, and any air adjustments to give me my ending balance. And so obviously, again, um, anything that makes up the change columns here from acquisition to air adjustment are going to show up on that detail report. So they can easily see um, you know, the tags that make up those amounts. Um, and just back up a sec here. Um, with the um, schedule change in depreciation, um, like I said, we do have a recording out there that talks about this report specifically. And then we also have a recording from the overview about balancing a depreciation reports. Um, and basically that's balancing the schedule of change in depreciation against the book value. So it just explains how you can balance the two. Okay, so those are our um, gap reports that are suggested to be part of the fiscal year end run. Um, the non-gap reports are listed here as well. Um, so just to cover these, because I know um, we have some you know, newer staff members that came on board this year, and I just kind of want to go through these. Um, asset listing by grant source. Uh, this is a listing of the acquisition transaction data by the source code. So it's um, the counterpart was the 203 report in Classic. So basically like the, um, the fixed asset, the source report, the gap report is kind of similar to this asset listing by grant source. It's showing the acquisition information. Um, but in this case, you can include capitalized and non-cap in this report. Um, the brief asset listing is a pretty popular one because it's a summarized report of probably the most common fields that are looked at um, on the item. And so um, it is recommended that it's run uh, five different versions. And so we have the list of all the different ways and all of these are available. Um, so should be able to run them by these um, specific options. Uh, the book value is um, the uh, depreciation information. So it does contain the original cost on it, but it also contains salvage value, the book value, uh, the percentage of depreciation, and the last year of useful life. So it includes not only the life today and the fiscal today, you know, it's including all that information in there. Um, and so this is the one I was saying that can be used um, to compare against the schedule of change and depreciation. So when this is run, it's, it's using the current fiscal year as the reporting date, and it um, based on audit report in the past um, is that it does have uh, four different ways that they recommend that this gets run. 
Um, we are still working on depreciation for the current fiscal year dispositions. We don't have that date range for disposed of yet on the book value, but I do have the JIRA issue and um, that's gonna be tied to that, that, that they'll be working on. So um, that's the only little hang up um, that we don't have regarding that one. Audit report, um, tracking changes. Um, so um, the audit report has a official report. Um, let me go into that one. And forgive me if you can hear a, a lawnmower here. I think my neighbor's lawn is yelling. Um, there's the demand option, which they can run whenever they want. And there's also the official option. The, the main difference between these two is that the official provides a signature at the end. Um, otherwise, um, it, it works the same way as the demand. Um, and so here are the different options that can be used. Obviously, if you're going to be doing this for fiscal year end, you'd put an entire fiscal year. Now, with that being said, we all know that we have run into some issues with, um, for some districts, um, not being able of the audit report to be completed. Um, it just, it won't complete or it won't run at all or it completes with a blank uh, report. And so obviously, you know, we did do some updates, I think on the 1.35 release uh, to help improve the performance issues in the audit report, but we still are working on it. We've got some, uh, some um, other issues out there that we still need to look into the audit report performance. Now, if you know you still have districts from fiscal year 22 that haven't been able to run their audit report, we may not be aware of that, um, please create a ticket um, and we'll look into that. We kind of really need to know, um, is it, you know, if they're trying to run it individually in here, um, is it generating? Um, it's not completing or is it completing with a blank report? And also, is it affecting their fiscal year end report bundle um, when they're trying to run it for 22? So if you know you do still have some uh, districts with those issues, you know, create a ticket so we can look into that and see what's going on. But like I said, we, we are aware of this and we um, are continuing to um, resolve those issues. But I have some good news that I will be sharing with you here in a little bit um, about the upcoming fiscal year when it comes to the report bundles. So um, the next step then is to close the current year by clicking on the close icon underneath core fiscal years. So what that does is it advances the last closed year underneath core configuration. Um, and so basically it did show 2023 or 2022 is the last year closed. Now it's gonna show 2023 is the last year closed. It also is going to add one year's worth of, de of depreciation to those items that are tracking depreciation. Um, and for those new items, um, it's going to update the beginning balances for the new year. Um, so those capitalized items, especially, um, you know, we need those beginning balances um, in order to generate gap reports. Um, so that gets looked at as well uh, when the year is closed. And it also generates the inventory uh, report bundle. So what we're doing this year, and it's part of the document store that is going to be coming out at the end, near the end of this quarter, so before the end of the fiscal year, um, is it is going to generate the necessary reports for the report bundle, and it is going to automatically send them to the new document store that's out there. So the whole email process will not be used this year. Um, so what happens then is you're like, okay, great, it's gonna to go to document store, but can we see the reports? Yes. Um, the inventory application is going to have a new file archive menu similar to what you see in USAS and payroll. And that is going to allow you to view those reports within the inventory application. Um, I don't have any more details than that as to how that's going to look or anything. I have not seen um, any of that yet. Um, this is just what has been reported to me 
um, regarding this. Um, so this, you know, the, the importance of getting this done before they start closing out for inventory is crucial. And, and the developers are aware of that. So um, we want to kind of get, you know, rid of the whole um, emailing process, a zipped file to uh, the treasurer, and instead use the document store. Um, so yes, I, and I knew you guys were going to start asking me all these questions. Uh, what version will that be? I don't know at this point. Um, I It's not really on a specific um, version yet, um, but it's to be done um, by fiscal, you know, close to fiscal year end. Um, and will this work for prior years? Okay, so that's a good question. And so what's going to happen is um, for whatever year you're closing, um, it's going to send it to the document store. Now, if they created an inventory report bundle for fiscal year 22, um, already, they already did that, you know, last year, they are going to be able to take those reports and that um, email, you know, that zip file, and they're going to take those, be able to take those and move them into the document store as well. So any prior, um, you know, zipped files, inventory generated reports will be able to go into the document store. As to how that's gonna happen, I'm sorry, I don't have any specifics right now. Um, and as to when that's gonna happen, I don't believe that's gonna be ready at the end of the fiscal year. Those prior year reports, including EISCD, reports um, are going to be um, able to be loaded into the document store on the next phase. So that'll come after this, um, after quarter two. So in either quarter three, I'm assuming, or quarter four, um, somewhere in the second half of this year, they're going to have the ability to go in and load that. Now, just um, a reminder is when you guys did the extracts, um, before migration to extract their data out of um, EIS, it created a zip file of all their EIS CD reports. That zip file then um, is the you know, one that you guys have stored. Um, that's what is gonna be loaded into the document store. So again, as to how that's going to happen, I'm not sure. Um, I don't have those details, um, but you, know, you will be able to take the classic EIS CD reports any prior year fiscal year end report bundles from inventory and load those in the document store. And then from here on out, um, starting with you know, fiscal year 23 here, you'll be able to go in and when they close the year, it will automatically send it. And like I said, they'll be able to go into the inventory application. We'll have some type of file archive menu similar to USAS and payroll that they'll be, then be able to go in and view those reports. So that's what is on the docket for this fiscal year. So I'm very excited about this. And obviously, once we get more information about document store, I know I think I've told a few of you that um, we are trying to get a, an email sent out to go through document store and provide more information to you guys. Um, and so they're still working on that. And once they get that um, put together here, we will send out an SSDT notice talking about document store. And in that, we'll go into more detail on the inventory part of it. Any questions about that before I move on? Okay. So, um, you know, once they close the fiscal year, um, obviously, um, if they want to start processing in 24, they need to create 24 first underneath core fiscal years, open that year um, and make it current, um, and then they can start processing for the year. Uh, so one thing to be um, cautious about is if they decide to leave 23 open and they don't close it, and they create fiscal year 24 and start processing and they run like a book value or they run a gap report, those figures aren't gonna be correct because they never closed 23. It didn't have a chance to um, update those figures. Um, so that's just one thing to keep in mind is if they 
don't want to close 23 out yet, but they want to start processing in 24, that's fine. But, you know, some of those, the gap reports and the book value, um, they aren't going to have the most up-to-date amounts because 23 hasn't been closed yet. Um, I think most of you, your districts are either, you know, on gap or, or not, you know, at this point, but um, if the gap flag is not enabled and this district would like to start on gap for the next fiscal year, um, and that's kind of like our classic EIS gap uh, program that we had. Um, there is um, ITC in intervention is required for this. You guys will have to do this for them. Um, there is an enable gap flag underneath um, core configuration. And I can show you guys where that's at. And so um, obviously when it's enabled, it'll change it to a disable gap flag setting. But if I did not have my gap flag set, it should say enable gap flag. And when that happens, then um, it will automatically check the gap flag down here. Otherwise we don't have access to this. This is just an FYI field. And it will go out there and also generate a report to show what those new you know, beginning balances are gonna be. Um, and then at that point too, they're able to run, um, it's going to obviously change um, some security settings within the application, like going into the items, um, an, an actual item, you can't just go in and add, you know, modify an original cost in there. It, some things are on lockdown now. So the fund, function, asset class, original cost, those aren't things that you can just go in and edit in an item anymore once the gap flag is set. So it'll do all these like necessary uh, security things. Um, and um, yeah, it'll generate that report and it will also allow them to go in and generate the gap reports. Um, if the gap flag is uh, not enabled, they can still see the report option here, the menu, <clears throat> but when they try to click on one of these, it doesn't do anything. So once gap is enabled, they'll be able to generate these reports as well. Okay, that's all that I had uh, regarding inventory. Um, so we do have some, uh, we do have one upcoming uh, training session in September for inventory imports. Um, but you know, I, if you guys feel like you need more training on specific things that you know, weren't covered in the overview sessions, or you wanna you know, dig deeper, into specific things uh, regarding inventory training, I can squeeze in um, some Fridays with fiscal sessions this calendar year. Um, a lot of our last Fridays of the months are open. So if you guys feel like you really need um, more training on something specific, either um, enter it in your evaluation for today's session or send me an email um, and let me know and then based off of the feedback I'll get, um, then I can go in and create some more inventory training sessions. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, um, I'm gonna go ahead and um, move it over to, since we just took a break and it wasn't too long ago here, I'll go ahead and, um, Stop sharing my screen and have Andrea get started with payroll. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. It's the screen I want. Yep. Okay, so can everybody see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and can hear me. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and get started with the payroll side of the fiscal year end. Um, again, uh, like Amanda and Michelle showed you, um, you can find our um, payroll side of the documentation under the SSD trainings, uh, meetings and trainings. If you go to that page, and then if you go down to our 2023 fiscal year end, and you can go ahead and open that up. And here you'll see, um, I have the current um, PowerPoint here for you if you want to follow along. 
and also the checklist, which will take you directly to the fiscal year and checklist here in our documentation. And then I have some other supporting documentation here for you for the upcoming um, this um, fiscal year end that you can look at. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. And again, um, this is just a generic procedures. And again, uh, you with ITC um, can just go off of this and create your own um, if you're doing your own fiscal year end meetings and such um, to use. But this is just a, a generic um, process that you can um, start and add if you want to it. Okay, so let me do a slideshow here. There we go. Okay, so the first thing um, we're going to be, um, again, what I just had said, we're to find all this information um, in the links where you can go for that. So the first thing we're gonna be doing for the pre-closing procedures, um, we're gonna be going over the process of the life insurance premium payments. And this would be also for if they got included in the last pay payroll of the fiscal year, or if they didn't, and then what needs to be done if um, adjustments that need to be done if they did not get that included before the last pay. Also, we're just gonna kind of go over the S3S advance reports. And then also we need to make sure that your districts are verifying the advance um, configuration, that it's zero, and they have that on flagged and make sure everybody is on flagged and FOSS for advance before they start. And I'm assuming pretty much um, every district probably is got that finished by now but they just wanna really start making sure that is complete. So the first thing we're going to be going over is um, the cost of the life insurance. And this would be for any of your employees that might be retiring before the June 30th. So that would be your last pay. And you wanna to wanna to make sure that they get that amount, figure that amount out, um, what they're gonna to have to pay, and then enter that into the current or future. And if they do have questions on how to do that calculation, if they're not used to doing that, we did include the link here for you. And you can go directly to that link here of the publication. And also, again, I do have that here too for you. Okay. So in this pre-closing, um, the payroll payments future. So if you haven't started your um, last pay yet, then you can go ahead and enter that in future, select your employee, select what compensation you want it to be under, and then include the life insurance premium. And then you can do a description of NC1 if you like. The unit will be one. And then the rate, you would just enter um, the amount that you, after you did your calculations for what they need to pay, to enter that amount in. Then also, this payment does not apply for retirement, so you can uncheck that. Now, if they leave it checked and they try to save it, it will throw an error. So they can't, they can't even get past this without checking that. So they don't have to worry about, oh, retirement got taken out on this, and then they have to do corrections. Um, it will flag an error, won't let you save. So then go ahead and save that. Now, what they want to remind you is to make sure if you're using a compensation that gets calculated, you wanna make sure that rate stays at the amount that you um, actually entered, because sometimes that can um, update and throw in the rate of the compensation, just in case, because I was doing some testing and it did it for me. So I just wanna just throw that out there, just to double check to make sure that it actually didn't throw in the rate of the compensation. Now, if you already started initialize the last payroll, and remember that you still had to do that, you can use your current, go under the current payments, find that employee and edit, and then bring, and then um, add a line and show the life insurance premium for that position. Again, same thing, you wanna use your unit of one, enter the amount that you calculated. Our example is $100. Again, you can, um, enter in the life insurance, which I think that one actually brings in the life insurance when you do the current and make sure on applied is on a check for retirement. Again, when you save it, it should not save and um, allow you even to have that check because it knows and it caps, caps, captures it and says life insurance can't have applied retirement for that. Okay. So what that does then when you're processing through um, the payroll of that last pay, it adds it to the total and applicable gross 
um, even though there's no tax being withheld. And this is due for the W-2 purpose. And that's what that's doing. Um, again, no federal, state, or OSA taxes are, um, are not withheld when they're processing that through the payroll. The only thing that is um, withheld would be the Medicare or FICA for the employee. So the system will calculate that. And then if you have city tax and uh, for a district or for employees, um, they want to make sure, you know, let me get out of here. And let me go to the city. And where you can find this is under the payroll item. The system is running slow. I'm going too fast for it. There you go. So what you want to do is for that city, the non or the tax non-cash earning. This is what box determines if that NC1 is taxable or not. So by now, um, all your cities probably are set up correctly, but if they do have questions, they probably will have to contact their cities and find out if that is taxed or not for employees. And then when that box is checked, what it'll do, will calculate that um, whatever that percentage is for that insurance um, and tax it automatically through the payroll. So it will be taxed when they run their payroll and be deducted and they'll pay for it at that time. Okay, did I jump? I think I did. Yeah, I did. So, um, so that's what that box is. And here's just a screenshot in the PowerPoint. So you have that. Okay. The next one is um, if, the, if they did not get it entered for the last pay before they were done um, and they already closed payroll, outstanding payrolls have been ran, so what they can do is go ahead now and enter that. Um, they have to use core adjustments. And they can go under core and use adjustments then. And this is if they didn't get it in before that last pay of June. So they want to find that employee and enter the payroll item 001, select life insurance, and then enter that amount in. Okay. Now, if they're using it under the adjustments for W-2 report, what it will do, it will add the amount to the total and equitable gross to the federal, state, and OSCI and Medicare. So you don't need to do any adjustments to these total and equitable gross. So only thing you need to do is that one adjustment, which is right here, to get all those figures um, adjusted correctly. Again, same thing for the city. Is it based on the um, on that core payroll item um, configuration? So we want to make sure that tax non-cash earn checkbox is checked or not. It just depends on that city. And then if that Medicare withholding was paid by the employer, employer, they will have to do adjustments for this. And they will have to get the money either from the employee for the employee portion or the board will just have to pay for the employee portion since they didn't get it in in time. So again, that's up to the district's policies of how they handle that. So here is an example of the Medicare by, um, if it's paid by the employee and the employer. So what you would need to do is go into the adjustment journal, select the employee, select the 692, and then the amount withheld, and then take that, um, whatever your um, amount for that $100 that we entered in that 001 for the life insurance and take that times um, what it should be, the amount, and take it by 1.45%. And then that's $1.45. Again, yours probably won't be that simple, but if it is, um, that's what it is. And then same thing goes for the $1.45 um, for the employer paid adjustments for $100 if that was your life insurance amount and then go ahead and save those. I also included a screenshot. Now, if you have employees that are Medicare pickup, employer paid adjustments, um, I have an example here. If the district is, uh, if the life insurance is $100 that they have to pay, um, take that uh, times the 0.0145% times two. So it's $2.90 that the board's going to be actually paying for um, total. So what you want to do is take go to the adjustment for that employee, 
go to the 692, and then go to the boards, pick up amount, a payroll item. And that's kind of um, down here further um, in the selection way down here. So kind of way at the bottom when you're doing the adjustment. And then you only want to enter the $1.45 because the system software knows that the board's pickup amount knows that it needs to separate um, and cash out $1.45 for each. So it's going to show $1.45 here and $1.45 here. So it breaks it out for it on using this board's pickup amount of payroll item. So only one entry needs to be done if they're full Medicare pickup. Okay. Andrea? Yes. Sorry, I just want to make sure that I am understanding. So this, if it was $100 life insurance, that's not inflated with the Medicare pickup? Because normally it's like, you have to do a whole calculation for a Medicare pickup. I just want to make sure that I'm understanding before. <laughs> you know, that's a good question. I guess I'll have to look into that because if you're doing employer paid adjustment because I just did the hundred dollars off a dollar or off the one time and I will have to look into that I don't believe it is I believe it's just the okay of that amount but you know I, I will want to make a note of that and I will check into that and see thank you because I don't want to tell you wrong just in case okay Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so that would be your Medicare pickup for the employer paid. So the next thing um, on this, if they use the life insurance premium amounts um, during payroll, it's not gonna be in the total gross that's charged to USAS when they're doing the payroll submission file. So they just wanna remember that. Um, in the pay report, they're gonna find this amount under the pay type totals, under the pay amount summary report during the payroll, they'll find it under other pay and all pay. And also on the quarter report, they're gonna find that NC1 under the total summary. So again, those can assist them when they're um, balancing. And the other thing I wanted to remind you, if they do, and they forgot to do several employees that did not get that life insurance in before the last pay, they can go to that adjustment and type in life insurance here. And say you have like 20 that you forgot, you can go ahead and then run an Excel spreadsheet and just pull those employees up. So you know who um, was entered after the fact. And also you make sure your transaction date is just for this fiscal year too also. But that's just another helpful hint that you can use. Okay. Um, the next thing now, what we want to make sure is that your districts are already going through and running the SRS advanced reports. Um, as of now, they can start running them. Um, they should be running them, making sure that their errors are all um, fixed and corrected. That way, when they are processing in the end of June, they're not panicking. Um, so one thing I did want to say that has changed this year, if you're not aware, and make sure to let your districts know that they cannot process any July payrolls until they are completely done with um, their SRS advance. So until that's done, they cannot process. Now, if you have districts that don't process STRS advance reports, they can use the STRS advance configuration, which is located under configuration. And I don't think there's very many that don't, but if you do, you at the ITC can go ahead and uncheck this box for them. But then everybody else, please leave it checked because if they try to process their July payrolls without running in Esther's advance, none of their um, payments for July will have that um, considered advance. And then they're really gonna cause a run into issues. So this was our fix for that. So districts cannot move on until that is completely done. But again, if you have districts that don't process, you can just uncheck that and save that for them. But otherwise, if they try to run a payroll and sneak by it and try to run it, they're gonna get an error since you cannot run it until that payroll is done, until, you, until, until the starts advance is completed. 
Hey, so I just want to bring that up first. Hey, Andrea. Yes. This is Vicki. Um, is, is the ITC the only one that can uncheck that box or can they a go in and do that? I think you guys, I think that's an admin privilege. I don't believe anybody else is. Lori Nye, do you know? I can't remember that. Might I might have to look into that. Because it's is actually. Okay, because if if someone else, because that's what I was asking, is there a way that it can just be an admin privilege? Because not that we don't trust our districts, but right, right. Oh, I get it completely. I understand that. Um, let me. I, I believe it. It's an admin. But if Lori Nye is on, if you could check that for me, I believe. I believe yeah, it's admin. It I don't. I don't think general manager has it. Okay. I think it's only us admin that have it. So okay. let's hope it, it it is that. So you at the ITC is the only one that can do it. Okay, but we perfect. will double check that and she will find out and probably put that in the chat for you. Okay, thank you. Sorry. All right. No, that's fine. That's a great question. Great question because we don't want them to sneak by. That's right. why we put it out there. <laughs> thank you. That's That's a great question actually. Okay, so after that, so I'll go back to the pre-closing. Um, you um, want to make sure that the districts are running their non-advanced position reports, advanced position reports, and their advanced fiscal year today reports. So their non-advanced reports, now the ones that are used for the classic, the non-advanced.txt, that's what it used to be called. And probably next year we be take, we're going to start taking off all the classic names because by then we had, you know, a lot of people had a good year underneath their belt for the, um, the ones that just came on. But for this year, we're gonna leave them on yet, just in case. Um, the advanced position report is the SIRS advance that text from classic, and then the advanced fiscal is the SIRS advance that report. So they wanna start running these, making sure their errors are um, corrected. Again, in our documentation under SIRS advance, down and below here, we have our warnings and then pretty much how to fix them to get those cleared up so they can utilize that. So the non-advanced position, this is positions not advancing. So this may be your superintendents, your directors. Um, that's all that should be on there. Um, these work as of June 30, and then your contract obligation will be on there and the amount due. Now, if you're showing teachers on there, maybe you have, um, you're seeing, you're around it, and you have like a stack of teachers that are showing, and you're not sure why. What probably happened is when you're when they ran, um, purged a contract, maybe you're, you're from classic yet, and they came over in the middle of the fiscal year, they didn't purge the contracts correctly at that time. So to get those teachers to advance, you're, they're going to have to do some adjustments to get them advance. So what they're going to want to do is they can use um, like the work calendars for those teachers, add W's to the weekends. So hopefully that maybe they're only missing four, but if they're missing quite a few already, um, they can update four at least in one payroll and put W's on those um, for the next payroll run that you'll be running here and get those W's in there. So that way those will update your work days and update your retirement and update the, the re retirement reports by doing it this way. And then once they run that payroll and completed it, they can go ahead and remove those W's then, okay? Because the history then includes that and you'll be fine. Um, another thing they can do to get them off or to advance is use the compensation adjustments. Um, the only thing here is um, they can update the days worked for that contract. So they match, so they advance, but then also they're gonna to have to um, adjust the amount earned because that affects the amount due. Now, when you're adding it to the Ws, that automatically does it for you during the payroll. But when you're doing the compensation adjustments, it does not. So you're just gonna to have to remember when you're doing using the compensation adjustments under the employee's compensation down here, um, if you're doing it that way. And again, this would be maybe for one employee to get them off the report, but if you have 20, then definitely use the teacher's contract or the con or the job calendar, whichever job calendar on to get them to advance by using the W's on weekends or a non-work day. Okay. 
And then also if you're doing the compensation adjustments, which I'm talking about this right here, is this. This is what I'm talking when I say compensation adjustment, the day's work and the amount earned, which will update your um, accrued wages, which is your amount due. And then also what they will have to do, probably gonna be missing retirement days. So in this instance, they're gonna have to use adjustments and use the STRS to get that, um, the update, the, the retirement correctly. So that one has a little extra steps in it if you're not doing the Ws on the actual um, calendar. So there's two ways to do it. Um, if one or two, you can use the compensation if you want. Um, if not, use the Ws and that updates it correctly. Any questions on that part? Okay. The next thing you wanna do is run your advanced positions report. And this will be, should be all your positions advancing. Again, this should be current or what, you know, kind of go off of what they did last year. The report should match unless you have some new ones on there, but it should be consistent throughout the years of who's on the advance, who's not. And just double check those. The advanced fiscal year today report. Now this is gonna re re um, list all your STRS employees and all the service credits. So that you can double run that and double check everybody and make sure their percentage is looking correct. Or if they have questions, they can go ahead and start verifying and looking into those employees. So also just a reminder, um, service days, um, these are how they're determined is by counting the days from the employee's job calendar plus any attendance or absence days. Now, if they're running the reports and they're seeing that maybe some um, days are missing, have them check the attendance records and absence and make sure they have pay date stamped in there. Um, sometimes when districts are lagging behind and they don't get those days in there and they don't get included in a payroll, they won't get a pay stamp date on it. So then they're not getting included in that count. So have them double check their attendance, make sure their pay date stamps um, are all in there when they're before they start running these reports. Um, the doc days don't need a pay date stamp as of, as of right now because that uses the activity date. So that's just a reminder, maybe a little helpful hint um, to have them double check those attendance records. Okay. The next thing is, oh, and we already ran over that, but so the next thing would be our month and closing. Um, again, we won't be going in detail as we did before on these because this is something that districts do every month. So it, nothing has changed on these. So what they wanna make sure is that they run um, the payroll clearance account, make sure that is in balance in zero or they know if they have a month sitting in there, what it's for. Um, use payments um, for the check register if they're to reconcile their checks, outstanding checks for the month yet. And they can also use the auto reconcile process to do their monthly outstanding. Um, another thing, or excuse me, the reconcile check, excuse me, I dropped down one. So the next thing they want to do is process any of the monthly outstanding payables for that. They want to make sure they verify um, all the outstanding payables are paid before they move on. And they can do that by running um, my notes here, go into the SSDT outstanding checks report under home or reports It's listed under there, or they can do the payment transaction status report. And then when they go ahead and enter that in, they can put paid, they can put paid in here. And then what that does is pull it in all the ones that are paid, okay? So they can um, do that and make sure they have um, all their outstanding payables, what is still out there. The next thing they wanna do, they can run their STRS monthly, their service monthly. If districts use these for balancing, they can use um, make sure they run these reports. They also wanna make sure they run their census report and they wanna make sure they run the AFFORD, which is the Affordable Care Act report. And then they can print those off or they can save those on their desktop for later use. Um, they want to make sure at this time, if they process um, benefit accruals at the end of the months, then they want to make sure they do that 
uh, on, you know, as of June 30th to make sure they get those benefit accruals in, but I'm not certain maybe a lot of districts probably process them at the beginning of each month. So that might be done already, but just a reminder to them. Okay. The quarter end closing, again, this is something they do three other times during the year. So we won't go into much detail on this. But just a reminder, they want to go ahead and run their quarter report, which we always advise them to probably to run a quarter report, even to run it after every payroll might be a good idea because they can catch balancing issues after each payroll. And then they know that it's an issue with the payroll that they just did or if adjustments they did. Um, it's always a good idea just to run it. It's, it can save them a lot of headache in the end. Uh, balance their W-2 report, always start running that. That way, by the time they get in December, um, they can catch errors now if they do. Verify all outstanding payables. Again, if you have quarter end closing, if you have um, quarter payables that you run, make sure they're running them. Balance all the board paid payroll items. So again, those would be um, your city, or excuse me, any board payroll. So you wanna balance those to make sure what they paid actually, it matches what you have in the system. I was jumping the gun there. So you wanna make sure those board pay payroll items are in balance. Complete and file any of your quarter submission files. So these might be your state that you might have to do quarterly. Maybe you have city that you do quarterly and um, 941. So make sure those, they get those um, completed and filed um, for their quarter submissions. The next thing would be your balance and submit your ODJFS, which they do every quarter. And make sure if they're off and they have days showing up for people they never had showed days before, um, always have them verified default calendars because we see a lot of that at the quarter end because they uh, might add a calamity day or something to it. And then all these people are starting to show up and what happens, they just update all the calendars in their jobs and don't take out the default calendar. So having just check the default calendar on those, make sure there's no uh, W's or claim days entered. The next thing would be your auditor of the state report. Um, again, most districts probably by now are set up on the report bundle for this, okay? So they don't need to worry about running that. But if they don't, they're gonna wanna make sure they create these reports now. So if they don't have those report bundles, they can go to reports and run these reports now then, okay, for the fiscal year. If they have them already set up under the job or scheduler and they go out to the file archive, they should show them under the audit reports. Now, this is my test, so it does not show on there, but they will show under there if they're already set up um, and they're in, um, in the report bundles. And then what they want to do then is grab the grab that file um, either from the file archive if they do have them out there if they run them and then um, or if they create them on their own and go ahead and email them directly to this email auditor um, at address. We don't have that in our um, fiscal year and checklist anymore um, because this is something that um, is. Like we said, it should be created by the report bundles and they know that they need to send this to the auditors. Um, the next thing would be to create your service liability report. Um, again, this is used by the auditors later, which is the wage obligation by employee report. Um, we did have this as optional, but I went ahead and just changed it to have them run it because if they don't run it now, um, it can they if they try to run it later in July or August, it can cause issues. So we just put it out there, run it, have them save it. They can put it on their desktop, print it off, so they have it when they do have that um, that search library report does come in by the auditors. They have it. So I say go ahead and run it and don't make it optional anymore. Okay. And then run the search charge search um, search your charge report. And again, you want to make sure that they run that so they have that when they do get that report from um, SIRS. And let's see, I did right here. Um, that link that I have in here will take you directly to here. And this shows you um, kind of how that 
how they're coming up when they're sending you that report. How are they figuring out those figures? Okay. And just a reminder, it doesn't have a date on there exactly when it's due from in here at least, but it says uh, that surcharge amount is due within 30 days from that notification when they sent that final surcharge amount to the district when they calculated. So they can put that on their cal calendar that that needs to be in and remitted to SIRS by then within that 30 days. Okay. Okay. On to the fiscal year and closing. We'll go in a little bit more detail on this since this is our big fiscal year end here. Um, the first thing that stirs the vans, um, after um, all the pays are completed and before processing the stirs events, you're gonna remind your districts um, to make note, do they have any teachers or anybody that's advancing that are gonna have early contract payoffs? They wanna go ahead and go into their compensation and change the pays and contract at this time. And it probably will update their pay per period because they're changing the number of pays in their contract. So if they can catch this early enough, then when they are finished at the last pay and they go to SIRS um, configuration to show the amount, and they should be zero, but if they're not, this would be one reason why, because they probably had an early payoff and they didn't catch it before. But if they do it before the advance, then they should be okay. The next thing is any docs over the summer. They wanna make sure they enter any of these in, in future. So if they know teachers or somebody's gonna be off over the summer, get their docs in now, go into the pay, uh, future payment, select the doc, and then um, get that entered in for that employee for that um, total amount that they know. So that gets included when they run their advance. Then after they um, process that, um, after they process their advance and completed it and they're done, then go back in before the 1st July payroll and delete that future um, entry out. So just remember, they have to delete that out before they process that first pay because they don't want that still to be in there. So they know what's coming and they'll dock them probably, unless they dock them within that first pay. Um, and in July, then they'll have to set that up. So, okay. The next thing they wanna do now is really start running these reports and, and making sure they're balanced. Um, we did that earlier in the steps before, but now, um, now that they have their last payroll done, go ahead and get that report, start running all three of those reports. So here is an example. This is the SERS advanced report option, which you can find under reports and under here. Okay. So the first one would be your fiscal year today report. And now this will list all employees that are subject to SERS withholding for the fiscal year. So the criteria for these employees to be on this report they all must have the retirement set in position to STRS. That's your first one. Your second one will be the employee must have earnings in the fiscal year. So for the earnings to sum, we have three of them. We have for advancing compensations, you wanna make sure the accrued wages, um, what will happen to get that accrued wages, what it does is it takes the contract obligation minus the amount paid minus the amount dot to get that accrued wages in the software when they're when to be on this report. Any adjustment journals of type equaling total gross in the payroll item code equaling the 591 or the 691 for pickup for these employees with a transaction date that falls within that fiscal year that they um, ran the report for. And then a third is the applicable gross of any historical STRS pay items paid to the employee um, on those payrolls that are not imported from Classic, and then they have a pay date, again, that falls within that e fiscal year will be added to those earnings. So that is three things how the system is coming up with those earnings. The next thing it's looking at, employee must have a contract or a legacy compensation with a date range that falls with and between those current dates. And the compensation pays paid is not equal to pays in the contract or the compensation has a paid in the fiscal year. So this would be like your teachers who have August um, stop dates um, would not be, that would, those would be considered advancing. Um, employee 
Also can be a non-contract compensation, which you probably won't have many, but we have seen that um, as long as that date range um, overlaps on that fiscal year. But most of them are all be compensations, not probably not many at all non-contract, but just wanna throw it out there that they could have a non-contract compensation. Um, so the next thing is um, another thing that we found, um, if employees have a compensation stop date on their compensations, which they all do, um, and maybe it's a teacher and they put a date of 625 and they're not advancing, always have them look at that date because it has to fall within the academic date range um, and it usually teachers are always within um, August dates because they're getting paid over accrued wages over the summer months. So they will show on the fiscal year to date report, but again, it won't show on the advance report if that's the case. Okay. The next thing, um, here's just an example of the SRS fiscal year and report. And what it shows is the name, you have your credits, Thursdays, your earnings, non-tax deposit, um, which will be zero. Um, you have your non-tax advance amount, and then you have your report totals at the bottom. Um, again, for the uh, your today report, um, for to verify your service credit, what the system does, it, it looks at employees with 120 or more days receiving 100% credit. Employees with less than 120 days receive credit this is based on the STIRS decision tree. And I believe I have that. Yeah, STIRS calculating service credit here for you. And then the employees flagged as part-time receive service credit based on the STIRS decisions tree. And for those employees that you wanna make sure that under um, the payroll item 450 for that employee for full-time or part-time, you wanna make sure they're set as part-time. So you wanna make sure that flag is set up correctly in their 450 if they're part-time employees. And again, we concluded a link here that takes you right to the service credit. And I have it up here for you. And this is the new one for 22-23 fiscal year. And they can look, go ahead and look at this if they have questions on how is this calculating, okay? Um, again, re-employed retirees will always have a 0% credit reported with contributions, um, and the calculated service credit for re retiree will, will flag a warning. So just to remember, um, a reminder that they, that they will show that, but they'll have zero credit, percentage credit. Okay. So here's an example, um, again, of just the uh, balance report at the bottom. And then you have your retiree pickup down here, retiree contributions, retiree hiree count, and retiree advance amount. So that's down here at the bottom far right, if you have employees that are retired. Um, this is just a little side note, um, how these are being um, calculated for each. I'm not going to go into detail. Um, we have them listed here for you. Um, how the non-tax earnings and non-tax advance amounts are being calculated, how they're being pulled. Same for the tax earnings, tax advance amount. Again, these two should be zero because um, most of uh, the SERS uh, districts or contributions are annuitized, so they will have these as zero. The next one is the next box, which is your tax and non-taxed, um, the amount advance, and the regular pickup. So we just kind of detailed that out of how these are being calculated and where they're being pulled from if you have questions. Again, for the non-tax deposit and the non-tax total, again, where these are pulling from, from the 591, 691, and then also the non-tax deposit pickup and total advance amount for the non-tax total. Again, this will be zero, just like the tax earnings. And then again, here is the retiree. If you have districts that have retiree employees, it knows to look at that 450 um, part-time flag, and then it will go ahead and enter that information here in the bottom of the report. Onto the STRS advance report, um, excuse me, the position report. Um, 
The criteria for employees to show on this report, so employees must have a position, again, with the retirement code on their position job, on that position, as STRS. And they also must have a job status of active or inactive. Again, the employee must have a contract or a legacy compensation with a date range that will fall within that fiscal year or the current date that you're running it. And then the compensation um, contract work days, again, must equal contract days worked. Days work days as, um, or the compensation work days must equal the contract days worked as of June 30th. And again, this determines using the work days from the employee's job calendar. Um, again, the employee's contract work days cannot must not be greater than must be greater than zero, excuse me. And also the compensation pays paid must be less than pays in contract. The compensation contract obligation minus amount paid minus amount docked, again must be greater than zero. And archive compensations will not be included on the SERS advance report. So again, if you have advanced, maybe you have ran um, new contracts already and they're showing up on the advanced report, you don't want them to, you can archive them real quick, run the reports, finish, and then um, on archive them and they'll take them off the report. If the employee is, um, is on the not advanced report and needs advanced, again, like we said earlier, you can use the compensation adjustments, days work for the compensation and adjust the days worked and then they will get, and they will advance if you just have one employer or a few. So here's an example of the advanced position report. Again, you have your credit percentage, contract amount um, due, advanced employee amount, or excuse me, the advanced pickup amount, and the total amount advanced. Okay, and this is what they'll use um, maybe at the um, end of, after their last pay, if they're not balancing, they'll check, use this report against the check stirs advance and see what amount is off. So for the employees, how the software is calculating that last few pays during the summer months, um, it's calculating it on each single pay. So it's taken the 23rd, 24th, 25th, calculating them separately. And then that 26 pay is calculating that one day, one pay left. So it may not, might be off a penny or two. Like this one was $210, um, $210 and the rest were had 56 cents. So again, it does it separately, the calculation. So when they run that check stirs report at the end of the um, summer, when they're done, um, they'll see that was break, broke out for those four pays for each employee. Um, this was um, a report that um, districts can use if they want. Um, they have probably their own way of balancing their reports, but this is just one thing that we put out here um, that they can use from the compensation grid of the employees, because most of them will be compensations and not non-contract. They can go ahead and um, go to contract compensation, Select in the more, make sure they have the uh, um, ID, name, pay per period, last pay date, pays paid, pays on contract, the retirement code and appointment type. And then what they can do is filter by the last pay date, probably greater than maybe 630.22. So you bring in all employees that were paid in the fiscal year, make sure they um, the retirement code equals STRS. And then what they can do is pull in. Um, Excel spreadsheet and calculate the advance for each position if they like if they want to do that. And then um, when they generate the advanced position report in the Excel format, they can verify and, and kind of go back and forth and look at each one to see, you know, um, if the amounts are correct. Um, using the VLOOKUP, I'm not familiar with that, but um, you can merge those two Excel shed spreadsheets together. Um, maybe by using, if you have the same um, either ID or the user number, um, something that they can, um, the VLOOKUP can merge and look at and bring those two together. 
So again, um, just something out there that they can use if they like. Uh, the next thing is the non-advanced position report. Um, again, if, if you have questions, if an employee should be advancing or not, um, I would definitely contact the STRS and ask them because they would know for sure if that employee should be or not. Um, the criteria for that, employee must have a position with a retirement code such as STRS in a position, again, must, not, um, must be active or inactive. Um, again, the position must have a contract or a legacy compensation. Employee must have um, a contract or compensation, again, with that date range that falls within those current days. The compensation pays paid must be less than the pays in the contract. And again, the compensation contract work days must be greater than zero. The compensation contract days worked um, does not equal the contract work days. Or again, the compensation contract days worked will not equal the contract days worked as of June 30th. And again, that's determined by using the days from the job calendar. So here's a, just a quick um, shot of um, what a non-advanced report will show. Um, days in contract, um, days worked as of 630 in their contract application amount. The next thing, um, if you have questions, again, when you're um, doing your STRS advance, again, I had showed you that um, earlier, I guess the, the errors on the um, STRS advance report down here, um, they can use those if they have questions. Um, once, once the STRS advance reports have been verified and balanced, um, you can go ahead and print the final copies of all reports. If the district keeps those, they can do that. If not, they'll be out in the file archive. Um, go ahead and create the STRS advance submission file. And they always want to make sure, they always double check, make sure that advanced mode box is checked in the STRS advance configuration. Okay. And again, um, some districts might use that or they might use the core obligate or um, under organization. And this one might be a better way to let your districts know if they can't see the con configuration. Um, also, they have the option here. So they can see to make sure this was checked. They can't, they can't touch it or anything, but they can make sure the submitted to serves is filled in by the, uh, uh, the time and the date that it was sent and make sure this box and make sure the amount, advanced amount matches what their advanced position report is stating. They wanna make sure those two are, are matching before they move on. So what this does then, it creates your STRS advance with the um, year, which is 2306, text report. And then they're gonna go ahead and submit that file to STRS. But for your districts that have third-party files that they're gonna need merged, they're gonna wanna make sure they hold off. They don't wanna send that file yet. They need to merge their third-party file that they're gonna get from Renhill, I think is one of them. Um, so what they will need to do then, and again, they wanna make sure that that um, party file, that their third party file that they're getting is in the correct format. And let me see if I can find it. There's merge file, there we go. So they wanna make sure that they have that file um, in the correct format before they move on to that, um, before they try to merge it. Because if, if it's not set up correctly, it's going to, um, these columns will be off and that you can see it when you try to look at the report, it's not gonna look correctly. So once I do that and they get those, um, that file is correct and ready to merge. So what they're gonna do is go to reports, stirs advance, and they're gonna wanna um, go ahead and choose the upload advance submission file for the merge. And this is the one from the redesign that we created. 
And then the third party file is the one that you're going to do for the file to merge, the one that they sent you. And then generate the stir merge. Once you get these two filled in, then this box here will be able to be clicked. But right now I don't have any files in there, so I can't generate it. Okay. All right. So once you get that idea of looking and it looks good, everything, everybody's on there. I think most of the time they're listed way at the bottom of the report if you do a merge. So it will be on the bottom of the report of the ones that are getting merged in. Okay, once you verify that, that that is correct, then go ahead and click on the merge files. And then that will correct or create a STRS advanced merge.txt file. And then this is the file that they need to upload to STRS. Just for those districts that have that um, extra third party file that they need. So once they do that, you want to upload the submission file from your desktop. And then once that's uploaded and, and it's located under here, because it'll show that the file has been up um, is on the screen, then you go ahead and submit the upload file to SERS. Okay. The next thing, um, if there is, like I said, no third party file, um, they can go ahead and submit that file. Um, go ahead and just submit, choose the file, which is your STRS advance the, um, with the 2306.txt. Choose file and submit upload file to STRS. Once the file is submitted, um, again, they can verify in your configuration, um, advance. And again, um, we're going to double check on that. I don't know because I've been watching the chats. If, if they um, can see the STRS advanced configuration or not, but if not, they can see it under um, the core organization. So that's another place they can see it and they can't touch it from there. Okay. okay. Um, from what I'm seeing, the STRS annual report is due by the first Friday in August. Um, so the deadline for that is August 4th. So now when they create now and the, the reports will show, they're going to see these under, which I don't have any, oh, fiscal year right here. So they will show under here. So you will see um, SIRS advanced fiscal year today report, your advanced position, non-advanced position. If they have a, a third party, And what happens when they close that June posting? It sets off another bundle. And what happens then, these go out again to the fiscal year end reports, and they're set out here again. So you're going to see your attendance journal, benefit Andrea, if you can hear us, you are frozen here and there. Section come up. Mm, that's just great. <laughs> can you can anybody hear me now? Or am I am I gone? I can hear you now, Andrea. But okay, yeah, thank you. Were, you. Yeah, I did I had a sign say uh, I was having internet connection issues. So sorry about that. Um, did My, something got missed that somebody wants to go over? I don't know how long I've been out. Just the last slide you were talking over, like with the green bar on it. Okay. Okay. So the closing of the June 
Um, what that does then when you're in your posting period and you're closing, that sets off another set of report bundles that automatically goes out to the fiscal year end archive for the districts. And then you're gonna have the attendance, the benefit obligation report, account and employee. You have your leave balance report, payment transaction status report, earnings register report, wage obligation report by account and employee. So the reports are all set out there for them to use at a later time if they need to. So again, you probably definitely want to um, put in their notes that they want to check to make sure these reports are getting sent out to the file archive just in case something happened and they're not out there. So that way they don't go down three months down the road and then try to look for them, they're not there. Um, it'd be good for them to just double check to make sure those reports got processed and they're sitting out there and, um, and then they won't have no issues later on not having them. So now for the post fiscal year end, now you can create your July um, posting period for this next coming July, 2023, set it to current, and now they can start the first pay in July can now be processed. And again, since they cannot process that first pay until service advance is done, I strongly suggest that you let your district know to start balancing now or after each pay. Um, so that way, when that time comes, um, they're ready to go and they are not struggling and panicking because they can't get their first payroll done. Um, Another thing for items to consider why in SERS advance, um, regular and irregular pay types cannot be used. The DOC, if not included prior to closing, um, the retro, termination, those and the payoff accrued wages, um, again, these can affect the SERS advance balancing. So just remember if they're using these types, that's gonna throw off their advance balancing. Um, modifying the number of pays paid. So maybe they have somebody getting paid off early. They're going to want to make a note, maybe just keep it next to their desk and say this employee was paid off during advance. So that way, when they're trying to balance at the end of the year, they know exactly who that person is and how much it was. During the payroll process, um, the fiscal year to dates amounts on the 450, 591, and the 691, if they have pickup payroll items will list both the advance amounts and the new earnings. And then the pay report at the bottom will list the advance amount process for that pay. So they can look on the pay report each pay and maybe make note of each time they're doing the service advance amount and how much it was. So if they keep track of that in a spreadsheet, they can do that. Um, and next thing is, as summer pays are processed, um, again, they want to make sure they go to either configuration. Um, again, I have to find out. I don't know if Lori said that. Um, if if they have more than admin view um, or if they have a more than general manager, if they can see that or not. Um, organization. So always have them verify. Um, they can go on organization and make sure it's always decreased or adding on. And these two should figures should match by the time they get to the last, uh, after the last pay. This amount will always stay the same. This amount will be added each pay, amount paid back. Okay, so after the summer months are completed, um, if the amount paid back is equal or greater than the advance amount, then the district um, will no longer be in advance and the advance mode flag will be unchecked. Um, when the advance mode flag is unchecked, again, the amount paid back will be zero. If the amount paid back is less than the advance amount, then the advance mode flag will remain checked and the amount paid back value will remain. Now they have to do this in a timely manner because a lot of districts may not do this. Um, we suggest they do it right after their last pay because after the first of the year, it shuts off and that goes to zero automatically and they no longer can see it and they can't get it back. So they, they won't know. So again, advise them to run that and check that. Um, immediately after their last pay. Don't have them wait because if they're trying to wait until after the first of the year, um, it goes to zero because we're in the new calendar year. And again, I put that in here to let them know, um, try to run that before they get to the end of the calendar year of January, 2024. 
So what they can do is isolate balance, or isolate the balancing issues. And then um, again, they can use the report, check status report, which is listed under the STRS reporting, check STRS advance, enter in their start and end date of their fiscal year that they're using. And then that will list all four of the pays that show each, how much was paid for each employee. And again, they can compare that to this report to their advance report and, and see who, who isn't totaling what these two, between the reports. Again, like I said, it would be easier if they just kept notes of anybody getting paid off early, doc amounts, just have them keep a sticky note right by their desk. And that way they know um, right when they come to that um, end of the fiscal year, when they're done, they know exactly who it is and they don't have to do much digging. And then once they figure that out, report the corrections to SERS as prior fiscal year um, corrections. Now to get those off, um, if they have to do, they're gonna have to do adjustments because we don't want these figures to be sitting out there for the next upcoming fiscal year and, and messing up with those figures. So they're gonna have to do some adjustments in here. So they're gonna have to do the amount for the 450 total gross. They'll have to do a 591 for the amount withheld. And then if they have a 691 record, they will also have to do that for the SIR 691 for the board's amount of payroll item. Okay. And again, we have that out here in our documentation instructions if this is something um, that happens. Removing last year fiscal year and contributions from the SIRS advance, because we don't want that to interfere with next year's. So if they do that right away, then they're done and they don't have to worry about it when they're trying to run fiscal year 24 then. The next one is, um, oh, um, ITCs, um, you at the ITC should uncheck that box because you at the ITC, and this I know now, uh, admin can only do that, can only check the advanced mode um, box. Um, so he, you will, at the ITC will have to un, um, check them. And then also either the district or you at the ITC will have to make sure in the compensation grid and make sure and look for anybody with STRS advance field equaling true. And if they do show those employees, if you have multiple, you can use a mass change definition to FOSS, or you can just do one employee at a time. If you just have one or two that are still out there. So you just have to bring that STRS advance flag under more and bring that into your grid and then search for anybody that says true yet because you should not have anybody that's true. It should be all false. Okay. Um, if errors are discovered before the first pay of July is ran. So this is if they're running SIRS advance. Oh my gosh, I made a mistake. They already ran the advance. Um, still early enough. They didn't run their first pay in July. We can correct them. We can, you at the ITC can take the district out of advance. Again, we have that documentation here. And you can go right to, to this. Now, well, of course it didn't take me directly. I would change that. But um, we have the um, configuration um, right here where you can go and look for that documentation, there it is. And then, and again, you wanna make sure you use um, extreme caution on this and when you're taking them out of advance. So you have to do the mass change and take everybody's stirs advance out of FOSS and we have that here for you. And then you wanna make sure the number of people that are advanced matches what you're saying on your account here when you execute, okay? All right. So then, then the districts can go ahead, correct the errors, get whoever um, is needs to be corrected, and then rerun and verify the reports again, making sure that all those reports are correct again before they move on, and then generate the submission file again. And then upload that submission file by selecting the choose file like you did before, find the file, and then submit upload file to SIRS. Okay. If if districts discover errors that are already um, 
and they already processed their July payroll and SIRS says there's errors or they figured it out, by this time it's too late. So they're gonna have to do um, corrections with STRS directly. So now for the new fiscal year for the upcoming 2024, I just put a couple of things on there to reminder, um, make sure they can start adding their job calendars for the upcoming fiscal year. As soon as the board approves them, they can add new contracts can be entered for all the employees that are upcoming for the new contract year. If they need to start entering them, they can. Non-contracts can be updated or created for the fiscal year. Um, and also I just put in here that the final period L, um, that is scheduled to close on August 4th of 2023. Um, so after they did finish that and they got their final L submitted, um, they just wanna re uh, remind the districts that they need to go in and update that fiscal year under the EMS reporting configuration to the new one. Okay. Um, any questions on this? Okay. Um, we have some upcoming trainings. Uh, Fridays with Fiscals are coming up. Um, just to let you know, for June 2nd, um, we have review of the May releases. We also have June 9th, review of the STRS advance and balancing tips coming up. July 7th is a review of the June releases. July 14th is adding new employees fiscal with Fridays. August 4th would be the review of the July releases. And then August 11th will be the new fiscal year um, initial L reporting. Getting ready for that. Okay. Um, if there's no questions, then we are done with our fiscal with Friday. I appreciate you joining us. I hope you have a good weekend. Michelle, I'll leave it, take it over to you if you want. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for staying online with us here for the entire three hours. Lots of good information. Um, and obviously, we are going to be, uh, we are recording this. So we will be, um, once a, a recording is finished, we'll put it out there. And we'll also chapter it off and split it out, use as payroll uh, inventory um, so that you guys can go to those specific areas if you need to or want to reference it uh, to, for somebody else who wasn't able to attend today um, just to make it easier to review the certain sections. So everyone have a wonderful weekend and uh, we will see you guys soon. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you.